Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Tuesday evening, where we are going to be discussing something which I think will pique your interest. It, it's a, uh, it's not just a fascinating intellectual topic, but we're going to be delving into something which can have practical importance for us today, as people who want to see our peoples, our countries, our nations restored to something of what they once were. And to help me to do this, I have one of my favourite guests on this channel. It is, of course, Rupert August. Hello, Rupert. How are you doing this evening? Hello. I'm, I'm doing very well. Looking forward to uh, getting into these stories because uh, I think they're quite inspiring. So hopefully I can do them justice. Oh, very much so. It's uh, when you first came forward with this topic, it was just like, yeah, we have to do this because um, many of the historical characters we're looking at, even, even if it was just a history stream, it'd be interesting in its own right. But kind of the pattern that we're identifying is has some real importance to it. Before before we get going, I wanted to ask you, is there anything that you would like to promote before we begin? Um, nothing springs to mind, truthfully. Um, I might have some things in the work that I uh, can't really mention just yet, but uh, there, might, there might be something out there in uh, out there in future, so I'm sure it'll come up in a future stream. Okay, I one day we, one day we can hear about it then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, well, for my part, I'd like to promote, um, I can see in the chat, we have Plotlines, that's Connor's channel. And I was on that yesterday. We were discussing uh, Olmo from the Silmarillion. So please, everybody, go and check his channel out and subscribe. He's only a few few subscribers away from a 1,000. So please go and get him over the line. And then beyond that, this is actually the first time I've been live since announcing Wagner Day. And uh, so this is going to be the 27th of May. And it's going. we've had Tolkien Day, we've had Evola Day, we had Carlisle Day. But I wanted to do one to Richard Wagner, looking at his life and works, his philosophy, his engagement with German mythology, his politics, the way he uses music, all of those things. So if you'd like to be involved, uh, send me a DM or send me an email. You can find it on the, the advert. Already got a great lineup of people. Uh, so it's really coming together. And I think it's going to be something which I think it will add something quite different to what we've seen in the sphere so far. But anyway, that's the 27th of May. So watch out for it. Rupert, are you a big fan of Wagner at all? Yes. Uh... I must admit that it's been a while since I've really delved in, but um, mm. especially what he sort of represents in uh, in Germany is something that we would probably benefit from having uh, from having today. I mean, it, that that period is uh, is one that I'm I'm quite interested in, uh, and a little bit after. So, sort of the version of uh, Wagnerian um, nationalism and uh, and sort of like mytho mythological soul searching is uh, is. Yeah, something that we sort of receive very differently in the, uh, the Anglo world. So going back and seeing what we can learn would definitely be, be of great value. Oh, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you like Wagner. That would have been terrible if you said, no, I hate him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but also, you know, he's, he's one for restoring a sense of German identity and German culture. And today we are looking at uh, restoration or more particularly the restorers of the world. So let me add this beautiful PowerPoint that Rupert's put together, uh, Restorers of the World. Here we've got the triumph of Aurelian. And that, I suppose, leads us to our very first individual that we've picked tonight, which is the Emperor Aurelian. So, Rupert, I'm going to let you kind of take us where you want us to go. So take it away. Yeah, no problem. So it would probably be worth looking, uh, looking at this, uh, this name a little bit more closely first, because it does come from a Latin title that was actually given out um what some people don't seem to realize is that the title itself has a little bit more um history to it than uh, than just aurelian but aurelian represents the, the sort of purest form of of what the idea is uh, supposed to represent um so before we actually fully tell the uh, story of aurelian himself i think it's worth sort of pulling back um because the, the through line between the four characters that we're going to cover sort of requires that we uh that we look at who came before Aurelian. Uh, so to give some background, the crisis of the third century is in uh, is in full swing. Um, there are 
pretenders left and right. Um, basically, anybody who can have any kind of like a reasonable claim to, uh, not even reasonable claim in some cases, just anybody who, who can claim physically, uh, usually through soldiers or having some kind of like land base and, and money base, uh, can elevate themselves to claim the emperorship. And often because of the scale of the other problems that are being faced, i.e. barbarian invasions, uh, sort of runaway, runaway inflation, um, civil corruption, eventually disease, all of these things sort of culminate to create a full, like a full on crisis in the Roman world. Uh, and it makes the, the place more or less ungovernable. Um, especially with their uh, big, like sort of bigger threatening neighbors pressing in on them. So this, this map, um, uh, oh, yeah. sorry. I, I jumped maps just as you said that. Sorry. But I think yeah, this no, might so be the, more so the previous. Well, yeah. The, the, so the previous map, or, or this one, if you uh, sort of just assume everything in, in one color, uh, sort of like represents what the borders were roughly looking at, uh, looking like at the time, albeit with a little bit of extra um, Roman land in like modern day Romania uh, called da uh, Dacia at the time. And of course, you have the, the Germanic tribes that are also pushing in over the uh, over the Danube and over the Rhine, and you have the Persians pushing in from the east, the Sassanid Persians. In order to actually try to deal with this situation, um, it falls to um, what, well, the time relevant to our story, it falls to Valerian and his son Gallienus. Uh, so Valerian comes to uh, emperorship, and he at the, time, at the same time, for the sake of just trying to manage this. Uh, this like compound period of crisis. Um, Gallienus is put in charge of the West and Valerian in charge of the East. Uh, Valerian is, uh, well, he, his main focus at the time is to try and fight off the Sassanid Persians who they are at war with um, and making border incursions. And quite catastrophically for, for Rome, they, they actually uh, lose a, a substantial battle and Valerian himself is taken captive. And this is while uh, Gallienus is dealing with all of his own problems. And so this sort of like compounds, compounds onto his stress. It falls to, it falls to Gallienus to therefore try to maintain the entire situation by himself, eventually resulting in, in the East. So in the, in the face of this loss, uh, the Palmyrian Empire colored there in yellow is, uh, is separated by uh, initially a Roman loyalist named Odonathus. And he tries to, and successfully does, continue fighting against the, uh, against the Sassanid Persians. So he, he beats them back, but he maintains his, uh, his autonomy. And uh, although he's initially loyal, he's, um, especially his um, successors, they sort of take on uh, their own identity and try to carve out sort of their own, um, their own empire, which is going to be quite, uh, quite apart from Rome. In the West, uh, things are going about, about as well as you can see by the uh, the coloring of the Gallic Empire, and the Gallic Empire um, is another in, initially fairly loyalist, at least in the sense that um, it is initially concocted as a way to um, fight off uh, border incursions, which can't be fought by the the central government because uh, Gall uh, Gallienus is trying to fight off so many pretenders all at once. The The list is enormous, and those are just the ones we know about. It's something like 10 different uh, pretender armies that he has to fight off over the uh, over the course of his reign. Is it, is it worth just commenting on the, the laws of succession, or lack of laws of succession, perhaps, in this context? Because, and, and please correct me, Rupert, if I'm, I'm misunderstanding this, but as I understand it, it wasn't like, oh, the son of the emperor gets to be the next emperor. Rather, they have to win over the Senate or have the Senate proclaim them to be the next emperor. Or they need the army or they need the populace. And they kind of need some three of combination of the three. So if you so that allows for a number of pretenders or forces to rise up because they think they can get that support. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the uh, sort of like uh, father to son succession. Uh, had become more common uh, just as a practice, mm. but they were still sort of going through the motions, especially when you get to um, Gallienus and Valerian's time of uh, seeking, getting everything done, getting everything done through the Senate, basically. So the right. Senate does um, proclaim uh, Galerius 
uh, no, no, um, Gallienus rather, sorry, to be um, uh, to be co-Augustus with Valerian, and that that is, uh, you know, following in the same footsteps as uh, as Marcus Aurelius. But you, are, we are sort of like much more moving into the into the kind of time where, like, basically anybody anybody can, and eventually they will successfully um, raise themselves to to emperorship. Um, arguably, just as a sort of way to deal with these compounding crises, because as we as we're going mm. to get to, uh, a lot of the men who sort of take the power away from this uh, from the Senate. So obviously the way that we portray Rome by this point, it's already very thoroughly autocratic, but at the time they could still sort of like, especially if they were sitting in the Senate, they could, they could still have an impression that they were, you know, quite, quite important because they were at least selecting the emperor. Um, but after this point, it, it becomes a lot less, uh, that becomes a, a lot less of a significant point. So we're kind of like moving into the, uh, the dominate period as it's uh, sometimes called in the, in the history. Um, but when you get to Gallienus and Valerian, they're still you're still talking about figures who are very much in the uh, patrician, like senatorial family, uh, sort of like world, and and that that's the background that they come from. But the successors, not so much. Albeit, if they are, albeit, oftentimes they are still sort of like again holding to this same vision of uh, one Rome. Right, that's quite helpful then because it it shows that the political situation is quite unstable, in terms of there's a, there's always a power vacuum when an emperor dies, uh, yeah. or even when there's an emperor, I suppose. Um, you mentioned also the these plagues, and I remember reading that there was a plague, um, the plague of Cyprian. Yes, and like in Alexandria, estimates suggest about sixty two percent of the population died. So yeah. th that kind of gives a sense of how awful that's that plague was. How it must have decimated whole towns and and so on. It does so take no out at least one emperor as well. So it takes out an emperor as well. So and then the economic impact of that is obviously going to to knock over, um, and this all ties in. Then you get an increasing number of barbarian tribes entering into the empire. Mm -hmm. So they're cr they're crossing over the border when um, the uh, the army sort of becomes weakened by having its uh, its its ranks uh, you know hollowed out by mm. things like things like the plague and things like um, you know issues issues with the economy that mean that uh, you know they they start to struggle more and more for uh, for recruits because there's just so much turmoil. turmoil. Um, and the way that this is eventually solved is essentially through just militarizing the empire more than ever before. We kind of have a, um, I, I, I don't know, do we? Maybe, maybe the way that I've read a lot of um, history uh, on the Roman, on the, late, the later Roman Empire in particular, is that the uh, the militarization, well, the army becomes sort of like less effective, less less efficient, um, mm -hmm. and maybe that's true of the very end. But it's sort of like from this period, it becomes much more militarized, much larger, much more expensive, and uh, often much more well-equipped than it ever had been before. But of course, because they're doing that on the back of a smaller total like population, especially urban population uh, early on, that, that becomes something that is a massive strain and the entire structure of society eventually has to be, uh, has to be created around that more or less with um, things like the, uh, uh, no, what's his name, uh, Diocletian uh, mm. price reforms and such. So you know when you, when Diocletian is trying to sort of like fix everybody in place and fix all prices in relation to one another, um, and trying to make sure that all um, trades are are hereditary, what he's trying to do there is is pretty much preserve his his military stock and try to maintain the rest of the the rest of the economy in stasis so that he, so that he can keep having access to the army that he needs. So. Maybe I could put it like this. Um, Morgoth often talks about how um, the UK is currently a health system with a country attached. I guess what you're saying is that this, after this point, the Roman Empire becomes a military with an empire attached. Yes. Yeah. And if we're if we're looking much further forwards, then you can you can track this uh, very precisely down to sort of when Rome becomes, especially Rome in the West becomes more or less irrecoverable. And it's when they lose that army and, and never properly replace it. Hmm. 
Yes, maybe, maybe that will be a future stream, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, happy to <laughs> jump into it because it's a pretty. So the Battle of Adrianople and the Battle of the Frigidus. I think it's the Battle mm -hmm. of the Frigidus. Those are those are two battles which are quite uh, inspiring in themselves um, for sort of like what the what it looks like or what is possible when a, when a society is so completely revolved around the army. Mm. But a lot of the reforms that led them there are actually put in place by Gallienus. Okay, so they come his, from this crisis period, essentially. They come exactly from this crisis period. Uh, mm. And you could even track the, the rise of the knight um, from this kind of period as well, or at least in the sense of Western European uh, warfare revolving around heavy cavalry, because that's, that's exactly when, well, this is exactly when that trend uh, begins in earnest, because the entire Roman army comes to, be, comes to revolve around um, infantry forces predominantly, which are closer to the borders, especially in forts, um, so they fortify a lot of a lot of cities. Um, I guess you could you could also say that the the, um, the trend around fortifications, uh, you know, very intense fortification of Western Europe as well, and uh, mm. and all the castles and all of that sort of thing, um, becomes more relevant in this period as well. So instead of just marching out an army and meeting their threat in the field, you know, wherever they wherever they uh, they happen to find it, instead they are sort of looking at a more complete strategy of defense in depth and how they how do they protect the, the totality of the of the empire. Um, sufficiently to deal with the new and ever more threatening threats with fewer resources at that. I've, I, I think as well, this might be a good segue to start talking about Aurelian because he seems to fit with both of these trends that you've just described, the emphasis upon cavalry and the, the move to walling cities and so on. So could you say a little bit about Aurelian then in, in this kind of context? Yes. So... To, to link him into Gallienus, uh, again, Gallienus mm. is, is uh, constructing a lot of these, mili these uh, military reforms in a way to put more primacy on a central cavalry force. But by extension, what that means is that the, the main field army and the main thrust of Roman military might is found purely in the cavalry. And as a result, you get a, a generation of cavalry commanders who are the first to be brought up alongside, you know, in this period of intense crisis going from battle to battle, um, probably more than we even know, again, because the, the records from this time are so sketchy that uh, it's entirely plausible that uh, essentially they would just spend their entire time marching from one battle to another and uh, living life entirely on the move. Some of the, some of the empires around this period never, never actually go to Rome. They spend their entire uh, reign in the field, on, in military camps, going from one battle to another. I, th I think that's quite important because I don't I don't know about other people, but I've you kind of get this conception. Maybe it's from earlier Rome of like an emperor just sitting in the in Rome and sending out generals. Maybe it's a movie kind of idea, but actually they are being forged in battle here. They they know what it means to lead men in conflict, and I mean they they must be victorious a number of times before they can become uh, a possible candidate to become emperor. And I think we see that with Aurelian quite strongly. Rupert, you still there? Yes, yes, sorry. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good segue onto, onto the likes of Claudius Gothicus and, and mm. yeah, like you said, Aurelian himself. Um, interestingly, um, so when, um, like after Gallien, to finish the story of Gall Gallienus, um, we know that Aurelian was... Um, serving in the army that Gallienus creates and served for him for, for some time and sort of cut his teeth there because by the time he properly emerges into the historical records, he's already somebody who's quite accomplished and he is winning great victories at the head of armies under the uh, successor Claudius Gothicus. Um, but essentially after 15 years of, uh, of trying to sort of stave off crisis and keep treading water, eventually uh, Gallienus is probably by that time quite tired, he suffered a lot of tragedy and nothing in his life has ever really um, improved the situation of the empire. He's just been trying to hold it together and sort of uh, oftentimes failing because there, there, are, there are a couple of battles that he tries to fight to maintain the integrity of the, uh, the empire, especially in the West against the, Gaul, against the Gallic Empire. Um, but he loses that battle and is forced to come to terms with the fact that there are you know, large swathes of, of Rome that are no longer under his dominion. But he seems to sort of make some amount of, of peace with that fact, or at least just try to uh, focus on other things in the meantime, rather than falling into despair. And he 
uh, is eventually assassinated uh, during a siege, I believe, by a uh, by a subordinate in a in a conspiracy. So there's something quite tragic uh, about about his life. But what sort of comes out of that is what I perceive to be his his vision intact, in the form of first Claudius Gothicus, but then finding its perfection in Aurelian, the Emperor Aurelian. First, uh, Claudius Gothicus. He, he takes on the mantle for two years. And in that time, Aurelian is essentially his second in command, uh, fighting as the head of his cavalry. And under Claudius Gothicus, he uh, he's the one to actually defeat the Goths. Cla uh, Aurelian is actually the one to defeat the Goths, uh, thus giving Gothicus his, you know, the, his, his epithet. Um, but in, in effect, it's Aurelian's victory, the head of the cavalry, driving the, the Goths finally beyond the uh, Danubian frontier which provides enough of a barrier that the, the Goths aren't able to threaten Rome then for another hundred years. And then on the back of, uh, on the back of that victory, uh, I think he, he goes off and wins another victory against, I want to say either the Alamanni or the Vandals and uh, sort of puts them more or less, uh, well, not fully in their place because they still remain a problem uh, to, until he himself is able to actually uh, come to the throne and begin and begin his own reign. Uh, but Claudius Gothicus by that time is uh, is not is not able to see that that final triumph. Gothicus himself uh, dies. Well, Cla Claudius himself dies. Um, I don't forget the circ I, I forget the circumstances now. I think he either died of the uh, the Cyprian plague on campaign, or he is himself assassinated. But uh, I think I think it's plague because he he has to withdraw from battle because he falls ill, and Aurelian yeah. has to take up the the mantle even more so at that point. Yeah. But uh, actually, this is again. This is where the uh, the transition over to uh, a different kind of rule takes hold. The uh, the army more fully takes over because upon the death of um, Claudius Gothicus, uh, I believe it's his brother who then uh, takes over Quintilus, and that's at uh, at least partly at the acclaim of the Senate. And so Quintilus is in this position where he is, you know, theoretically the legitimate ruler of Rome, but he does not have the support of his uh, brother's armies. They instead fall in behind Aurelian, um, knowing him to be an extremely capable cavalry commander and uh, all round inspiring figure, it would seem. And so the first thing that Aurelian has to do is uh, put down this, this initial uh, challenge to his rule, establishes himself as emperor, um, getting the Senate to, you know, basically bow to him. And then he begins on his epic five-year um, reconquest, essentially, of uh, of the entire Roman polity until it finally begins to resemble what we know there on the right. Um, but if you could quickly bring up the uh, the map of what it, what of the situation that he inherited, although it's not necessarily entirely representative of what uh, of the situation that Aurelian was facing, because there were also a number of uh, sort of barbarians that are not properly represented on the map. So. Early on, he deals with the Alamanni, the uh, the Vandals, the uh, I can't remember what, what the uh, what the name is now, Junthagi, uh, Junthagai, something like that, something like that. There was something like that, yes. Yeah, um, he stabilizes the border uh, along the Danube. Arguably, that's a uh, that's a retreat because he essentially gives up willingly gives up a. Uh, Mm -hmm. a Roman province, but uh, ultimately it, it ends up being to the uh, to the long-term benefit of the empire. Um, beyond that, he he returns, um, I, I can't remember the, the exact timeline on Hispania, because Hispania may have already been brought back into the fold, but uh, it may be that, uh, you know, just before just before his reign, but it may be that uh, under Aurelian, it, it's brought back essentially by uh, might of character in, in some sense, um, and in doing so, they're also able to uh, win another battle to re-solidify the borders along the Rhone, and that gives them a very strong position to then uh, jump into the Gallic Empire once they uh, get the opportunity. But that isn't uh, top of his agenda, because first he has to deal with the Palmyrenes, and the Palmyrenes uh, at this time have set themselves up with uh, entirely separate ambitions and uh, are seeking to play the play sort of both uh, Sassanid, Persia, and Rome off against one another, with them as a sort of neutral power in the middle, able to sort of like uh, you know, arbitrate and carve their carve out their own place in the world. But um, no, Aurelian would not have it. 
<laughs> he he again he he commits to this idea. Uh, I think it's been sort of immortalized uh, elsewhere of. Um, and we'll, we'll get back around to some of his more, more civic reforms when we're sort of like moved on from the military stuff, but one empire under one guard under one emperor. And that's his, that's his vision for that. He, that I would say he, uh, inherits from Gallienus, uh, but he, he p pursues it to, uh, you know, proper, proper fruition. He subjugates Palmyra pretty swiftly. Almost uh, effortlessly, you might say, in some cases. Um, but at, at first, he decides to give them some amount of clemency. Um, they then decide to essentially spit in his face and try to reestablish themselves as a third power. Uh, but that doesn't uh, go terribly well for them because he just sort of turns around, goes back, and um, finishes the job, as it were. He holds a tri holds a, a grand triumph through Rome with uh, Zenobia in chains, the, uh, the sort of queen who had been more or less running the show from behind the scenes and uh and then in short order uh turns turns his in uh turns his eye west to go and subjugate the gauls seemingly more or less without bloodshed by that by that time having uh, sort of built up his profile to such a grand uh such a grand level that he uh he's sort of able to almost demand um subjugation before uh, before even having to win in the field there's an interesting story about that to do with the Palmyrene um, invasion because it seemed like most most towns along the way were just surrendering straight away. Um, be, those who opposed him, initially he would just destroy outright, leaving no survivors, etc. But there was one town in particular, uh, Tyana, where he was they had, they had resisted, but then um, he you know he was going to attack. But, the, the story goes that he had a dream that night and the philosopher Apollonius appeared to him and said to him, you know, if you want to rule, have mercy upon innocent blood. So he defeats this town, but he doesn't wipe them out. And then actually more towns surrender as a consequence of that because they know, okay, we won't face a reprisal from Aurelian if we surrender. We're not going to be punished for that. So this, this again shows... Well, there's there's two sides here. On the one hand, he has the power to just crush any any uh, town in in front of him, so that's going to bring subjugation uh, without conflict. But also, they know if they if they do surrender, there's a good there's a good chance they're not going to be punished as well. They're not going to face violence against them. So it it shows that he's got a, a sense of there's a sense of um, strategy there in terms of his engagement with other with, with other powers which gives him great success. Whereas if he was just destroying everywhere, he might have faced more resistance. Or if he was just showing clemency without the threat of violence, then it wouldn't work either. Yeah, uh, it's uh, quite an important skill of mm. of uh, men of this caliber that uh, they can sort of choose when, when it's appropriate to give clemency and, and when not to. Because ultimately, to skip ahead a little bit, the um, the thing that eventually is said to bring about his downfall is that a um, a bureaucrat who is feel it, who is fearing his um, uh, strict punishment and discipline even in the even in the civil administration um, thinks that he that because he uh, he was seen to have uh, made a mistake or or been corrupt that he was about to be killed by Aurelian um, and so he endeavors to act first and he assassinates right. yeah. he assassinates Aurelian. Yeah, so that I mean, that's the flip side of being too disciplinarian, I suppose. Um, but uh, but I think you're right that that um, oh, I'm, I'm going to get all uh, <laughs> I'm going to get pelters for this. But I rem I do remember Jordan Peterson saying something to the effect, you know, a lot of people think it's um, virtuous to do, you, you know, be peaceable or whatever. But oftentimes it's cowardice, whereas in a character like Aurelian, he knows he can use the threat of force or danger. Um, he can use violence to his to a good end when he needs to, but he channels that. He's not just chaotic and uh, you know burning down anything in his way, even his enemies. He's, well, he's yeah. Go ahead, Rupert. I was going to say there's actually another uh, another example that illustrates this point, um, mm. and especially where, especially sort of in charge of an army. Um, 
at this kind of time, it, it's, it becomes quite notable, especially later um, when armies in Rome are not necessarily quite so um, magnanimous. But he was able to actually dissuade dissuade his troops at, at one point from uh, sacking a city. I don't remember which one it was. It might even be uh, sort of like Antioch or Damascus or something. Right. Um, okay. Where he has to um, he has to climb atop a uh, uh, I think it might have even been the shoulders of, of one of his men and uh, and shout to them that uh, these are Roman cities that they come as liberators, not as uh, not as con not as conquerors. But and when when they go and fight true enemies, then they will have their plunder. And the I fact that the, the soldiers would actually take it from him and um, you know accept that well, it says quite a lot about his uh, his gravitas and his his character and uh, his ability to marshal the respect of his uh, his soldiers soldiers especially that many 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 more men could not uh, even of his generation even of his very impressive generation could not muster. Most definitely, and I think um, you know just as a kind of an aside, you know we're looking at historical example of what Carlyle would have called. The great man or the hero and he talks about in his lectures on hero and hero worship that within human beings we have a desire to uh, you might call it worship but it could also be obedience loyalty adoration of truly great men who have these this capacity to channel in an absolutely sincere way a vision of the world and they become also a almost a an incarnation or personification of that vision or set of ideals and Carlyle mainly focuses on um, other figures he doesn't look at the Roman period but I definitely think with Aurelian you could see that his soldiers so revere him so value him so want to follow him that even though it's against their nature or custom they will do as he says he has that command over them they they must have really in some ways, you could say they they loved him in a certain way, um, and uh, I think that's something that we'll see with all of these these figures that there's a certain, they have that um, they have that bond with their subject or their followers. They they are the Carlylean Kyle, heroes to a certain extent. Yeah, to a, to a great extent. Mm, um, to a great extent, yeah. Well, one thing I would I would notice that perhaps this uh, this trend is most acutely felt in Aurelian compared to mm. some of the later figures that we're going to look at. Um, because, you know, maybe you could talk about some, uh, maybe you could say something about the, uh, I don't know, about entropy or, or what we're, what we're moving towards uh, as sort of time goes on and looking back, looking back into this age of, uh, of comparative heroes where somebody could reign for only five years and yet still be restitute or orbis and restore, restore their whole world back from, uh, back from the brink of annihilation. Well, and, and I mean, it's the whole Roman Empire that he's brought back together, which is quite, you know, in, in five years, that's an incredible, incredible, incredible achievement. And then also from where he rose, because as I as I understand it, his father was a, a colonist. So he was a, a essentially a tenant, a tenant farmer. So this wasn't somebody who was coming from a place of aristocracy or well or super well connected. As you said, this was a time where people could certainly rise up very quickly, but it, it was his character and his martial prowess which enabled him to rise. It wasn't any prior privilege, you might say. Yeah. And, and, where, and... Whereas Quintilus, who is the brother of Claudius, is obviously riding off his brother's being emperor rather than his own ability or character. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But also to extent um, yeah. to an extent out of his uh, his sort of fidelity both to mm. both to the vision uh, because especially in uh, in one in in one version of the, uh, the the story of these successions it they are they are all nominated by their uh, their predecessor so in that sense it becomes a carrying forward of the uh, of the vision that that men like Gallienus had and were able to then bequeath on to the men that were capable of bringing it to fruition even in uh, you know even even in their darkest days. And there's even a there's a story that goes around that on his deathbed Claudius, uh, you know, nominates Aurelian as his, his successor. So there is, there is that uh, legend that also gets passed around. Although wh whether it's true, it's difficult to know, right? But uh, it would tie in with that idea. Um, it might it might be worth moving on to some of his 
civic reforms at this point, uh, because they, they are he doesn't just reunite the emperor empire, which is obviously really important, but it's the way I think that he it he he basically restores the whole of Roman life in a certain way, which is why he he can be plausibly the restorer of the world. Uh, so, Rupert, would you like to take us through some of these these reforms? Yes. So the the main thing that he uh, that he does is that he tr well he tries to get a handle on the inflation, I believe, with by uh, issuing a brand new currency. Unfortunately, I think it and it doesn't end up being entirely successful. Um, although obviously it's sort of like uh, on the back of his character and on the back of his gravitas, he's able to sort of make it work for a little while. But ultimately, by sort of decreeing the value of a uh, of a coin that is not actually you know de decreeing the face value of a coin which is not met by the actual uh, metal value is uh, is something that can only really go so far um he also if only if only he knew austrian economics right well yes <laughs> <laughs> poor aurelian yeah i mean at this point the uh, the understanding of economics is uh, is not necessarily entirely robust as uh, as has often been remarked upon, there was only ever one emperor that uh, actually improved the uh, the metal uh, content of uh, of the coins, and he was oh, which, he was later which emperor was, which emperor was that? Domitian. Oh, okay, right. Quite early on. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, he uh, he institutes very strict punishments for uh, corruption. So he cracks down on uh, bribery and. Uh, sort of like patronage on, on certain patronage networks. So he's one of the figures that's sort of breaking down some of these old uh, these old networks and trying to make Rome one in a sense. Um, many emperors have sort of contributed to this trajectory, um, but Aurelian is is one of the figures who uh, who is actually tr sort of trying to push this in the uh, in the ju judicial realm, uh, sort of even more than it already has been. Obviously, most famously, you've got uh, I believe it's I believe it's Caracalla who. Um, gives blanket citizenship to everybody who is currently residing in Rome. And that was quite a major step on this road, but uh, it didn't quite at the time break away, uh, break apart all of these, uh, all these normal patronage networks. But uh, Aurelian is sort of another, another of these figures to act to sort of cr crush that kind of thing with, uh, with a fairly iron, iron fist as, uh, as his sort of disciplinary nature came to, came to expect. So the, there's a kind of, um, Making the administration and the law equally apply, would it, would that be a fair way to put it? Yes, something like that. Um, I believe he also, um, in keeping with the same idea, I believe he furthers the the creation of uh, the administration as as you know you would sort of expect from uh, later quote unquote absolutists. Um, but he sort of like uh, is making strides bit by bit, you know, in, in the ways that he can on um, on this road towards more of like a, um, a civil administration backed by bureaucrats rather than um, by patricians who can be uh, sort of, you know, capricious at times. Mm -hmm. Well, you could see it also as, um, you know, De Juvenile talks about the dynamics of power of the high and the low allying against the middle. And I certainly see with Aurelian, you know, if he's the high, if he's the emperor and you know, he tries to make reforms which do help the, the ordinary citizen in terms of, um, I believe, like he changes the what's handed out is no longer grain, but bread, for example. Um, oh, he also massively well, increases the uh, the actual grain doll because he, he mm. um, inc well, he, he adds additional uh, items to it, I believe. So oil, right, yeah. oil and wine, I think, possibly. So the, the life of the ordinary citizens, citizen is going to improve under Aurelian. And then these reforms go against the middle, those who might, you could rise up or could pose a problem to him in time. He's, he's, he's taking on t under the law and essentially saying you're with my program or you're, you're getting punished pretty severely. Yes. Ultimately, uh, this kind of attitude potentially causes his death. Um, as I, yes. as I said earlier, um, but what he's able to achieve in that, uh, in that short period of time and the way that it's carried forward by his successors, um, into forming the, uh, you know, the dominate in its in its pure form under men like Constantine, no, you know, Constantine the Great, is uh, you know is something is something to be noted on because he does act as like one of the um, one of the main figures in setting this kind of trajectory. 
And I, I think um, maybe maybe another area in which he base he lays the foundation for somebody like Constantine is you've already you've already um, identified one one god, one empire, one faith as being kind of something that he developed. So could you say a little bit more about the uh, the cult of Sol or Sol Invictus? Yes, the uh, the unconquerable sun or the mm -hmm. yes the unconquerable sun. I think that's it. Um, that unfortunately, the scholarship on this is not exactly great as we currently understand it. So right. there is potentially some crossover with previous previous versions of the uh, the cult of the sun that were uh, that were elevated by various Roman emperors. Um, most ignominious, in, ignominiously, you could perhaps say uh, Elagabalus. He was uh, also a big fan of uh, of the sun cult, but. Uh, you know, arguably, it's a it's a slightly different version of it that uh, tracks from a different place with different rights and you know, etc. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it, it's really hard for me to say based on what I've read how how much this pervaded through Roman society and how okay. much and how much was just um, glorification from the from the imperial throne and from from the imperial position um, because no doubt he provided a lot of patronage to the church. But um, you, well, you know the 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 church or the cult of uh, of Sol Invictus. Mm -hmm. But how much there was, uh, you know, how much of that was enforced on the wider citizenry? It's it's hard, very hard to tell. That's quite interesting. Well, we could we could talk a little bit about what he does do um, in regards to it. So, for example, um, the coins that are minted have his face on one side and Sol on the other side. For example, yeah. Um, so the presence of soul will be felt across the empire, even if you know people aren't necessarily engaging with it. We have a number of games are held. I think it's twice a year games are held for soul during this period. He builds a new temple, so they become four temples to soul. Uh, and I, I believe he also he... institutes the um, the holy uh, rest day as Sunday. Mm -hmm. Sunday, right? So the day of the sun. Yes. Um, Yes, and uh, and th and that ties in with actually a festival, the birth of the sun, being either the twenty first of December, so the solstice, the darkest day. This is the day when the sun is going to be brought back in over the year, uh, you know, increasing light, or the twenty fifth of December. So we could see some parallels here with uh, later Christian festivals, and then he also founds the College of Pontiffs, and uh, this this college will essentially develop priests. Who will be dedicated to the service of of um, uh, Sol? But at this time, it becomes quite prestigious because it becomes members from of families who have senators, for example, who join this college. So it's it, it's um, higher status than it would have been before. I, I think as well the well if we if we focus on this idea of pontiff, pontiff means bridge builder. And there's this idea that the the priest is the bridge between heaven and earth. And I think Aurelian himself, who on various coins is described as uh, God and born ruler, he himself becomes the personification of Sol Invictus. And this idea that Rome, just as the sun is never conquered, just as night never suppresses the day, that the sun always rises, right? It's never dragged down into darkness. So Rome, the eternal city, that beacon of light from itself can never be conquered and actually will go on to thrive again. And I think that, you know, the choice of this, this God by Aurelian, if we were just thinking in terms of political messaging, it ties in so perfectly with his restoration of the Roman Empire, because in a way, he is like the sun coming back for Rome. The night didn't crush Rome. Actually, now it's flourishing just as well as it did before. There's another aspect to this that I would that I would highlight, um, which is the way that in, in which uh, the the sort of divine, well, I guess the divine secular comparison, which doesn't necessarily seem to exist in the same way earlier. So. Prior to Aurelian, you have um, emperors being elevated to god status after their death, uh, and so they join the they join the pantheon of gods. And mm -hmm. Rome is inextricably linked with 
the gods, of course, as as all sort of cities are within the ancient conception. But Aurelian seems to be, as far as I can tell, the first time in uh, the first time in Western Roman history that it well that it properly sticks, at least the idea that you would have a a true reflection of the divine realm and the secular realm. So in the same way that there is one sun god who who uh, who is presiding over the divine spiritual realm. Similarly, you have one Rome, which is presided over by one emperor who is all powerful. Hmm. So there's a there's a symmetry across all spheres. Yeah. And then I guess interweaving then as a consequence. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Hmm. That's fascinating. And so, I mean, if we wanted to go into kind of Evolian uh, directions with this, the sun being the source of its own light and sending it outwards rather than um, some rather than the moon which reflects light in the same way this is quite a self-confident Rome then under Aurelian that it's you know being reformed it sees itself as being this almost perfect civilization which beams out to the rest of the world its greatness and glory and civilization I suppose yes it, for, for a brief moment the Rome that conquers is back the Rome that conquers yeah um, but as you said it, it ends very very shortly for Aurelian in, uh, you know, he's assassinated five years into his reign. Does it, can does this kind of sense continue uh, for a while after him? As far as I can tell, basically no. Um, so the, the, the empire that Aurelian is able to restore is, is kept uh, and it's inherited fully formed more or less by his, uh, by his success, successors. A few that are short-lived, and then uh, it finally finally settles on Diocletian, that sets the trajectory sort of going forwards, and is uh, you know is considered to be one of the final figures of the uh, the crisis of the third century when he sets up his uh, his tetrarchy. Um, mm. But ultimately, the the imperatives that are created by Aurelian never never truly go away, and you you kind of see this this oscillation still playing out until the until the break becomes more final, um, where you, where you get. Um, the conflict between one Rome under one emperor, uh, as personified by the likes of Aurelian and Constantine, versus the the Rome that needs to be sort of um, managed efficiently and administratively, um, you know, like bro broken up into administrative divisions for uh, you know for ease of ease of bureaucracy and such um, that you see in Diocletian's Tetrarchy. Um, the split between Gallienus and Valerian earlier, and then you know much more finally at the end towards uh, I think it's Valentinian and Honorius. Hmm. Yeah, and no, that's, I... that split eventually becomes more permanent when uh, when East and West sort of uh, fail to actually work in unison. I guess this is the difficulty with um, the great leader or hero as the foundation of the order is once they disappear or, or gone, it's it's very difficult to maintain what they establish because it's so rooted in their person, the laws, the systems, the allegiances. And when that disappears, unless you've already established some kind of strong, strong guards on what they've achieved, it's, it's, it's tricky to maintain. Whereas for all, well, for all its massive flaws, a bureaucratic system, because it's not tied to any one individual can sustain over a longer period of time. But it might be it is probably a, a worse system overall, but it it's more able to persist beyond its members, as it were. Yes. So you sort of at that point you sort of lock in the entropy and you yeah. you get you get as many blocks to achieving greatness as you do checks on um on decline. That's true. That's true. Um just before we move on from Aurelian, I, I just want to invite people to if they have any questions or comments on Aurelian in particular, this might be a better time to do it than right at the end of the stream. Um, so before we move on, uh, giving people a chance to, to put in any comments, Rupert, is there anything else you wanted to add about him before we move on to Henry II? I can't really think of much to add about Aurelian himself. He's um, the, the the monumental achievements uh, in a way sort of speak to speak for themselves. And I think he's almost uh, an archetypal figure for uh, for restoration. He takes he takes a figure. Well, he, you know, he takes he takes a situation rather that is uh, teetering on the edge of total uh, total oblivion, and and then restores it to greatness in a very short space of time, basically through uh, 
through sheer force of personal will and competence and I mean, an uncompromising um, view towards what is necessary and what is good. Yeah, that's what I was going to add. He had, a, he had a definite vision of what Rome should be and what it should look like for, not, not, not just in terms of its military expansion, but also for the daily life of a citizen. And I, th I think that it was the, the whole package in that regard. He wasn't just a great military commander. No, he was also able to uh, project quite a lot of uh, power in the civil realm as well. He wasn't sort mm. of too focused on his own realm at the expense of at the expense of every other sphere of society. He he was actually uh, reforming things more in totality. Well, let us move on to our next restorer. Maybe not restorer of the world, but he certainly was a restorer. We have Henry the Second. So take us away, Rupert, with this with this character. We've moved forward several several centuries here. In a lot of ways, the world that uh, Henry the Second encountered is uh, quite similar to the one that mm. um, Aurelian comes upon, because England at this point is very very much uh, oh, what's the word riven riven by uh, discord and. and uh, well, the, the period is known as the Anarchy. It's, it's sort of one of the earlier English civil wars. Um, but in effect, what is taking place is less... The way that it's remembered and the consequences that it has are, are less um, one of defined factions that are playing off against one another, although that does exist. Uh, and it's as much about the complete destruction of central power and royal authority. And so what you kind of see is that had another man taken taken the throne, uh, potentially England does not come to be at all, basically. It, it splits up into something resembling the, uh, you know, the old Saxon kingdoms, perhaps, or, you know, just completely lacking um, a central authority that is able to bring everything into anything that is recognizable as a cohesive unit. And instead, what he does is project, project power all the way across France, to some extent, as far as... Uh, the top of Scotland and uh, in west to Ireland and uh, and even beyond places. And uh, the way that he does this is again basically through sheer force of will, personal competence, and just commitment to the vision that he is uh, the, the vision of his grandfather essentially that he is uh, that he's trying to uphold. Is it is it worth just saying at this point that this is so for because not everybody will know the very early stages of England that this is only less than a hundred years after the Norman invasion. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, you ha so you have William the Conqueror, who himself was a very strong, willful individual. But by this time, you know, that that initial spark has kind of broken into these different factions fighting. And as you're saying, the disintegration possibly of the crown ruling over the lands which William had established. Yeah, in, in terms of that kind of background, um... Up until this point, I would I would definitely very strongly argue that what you still have is a Roman Saxon divide that is mm. uh, not Roman uh, uh, Saxon Norman Norman Norman, Norman. Saxon, yeah, yeah sorry um, a Norman a Norman Saxon divide that is not something that we would cohesively call anything like a nation yet um, and the Normans that are ruling are very much uh, viewing themselves as far more apart from the, the people that they're ruling um, than they are from sort of one another. Although the way that they are actually uh, wielding their power is as the same kind of adventurers that they, uh, they, they all sort of originated as. It takes quite a long time for them to get this, uh, this all out of their system, but the bleeding that goes on through the, uh, through the anarchy, which is actually propagated a lot of times by the, uh, the sort of barons themselves who are wanting more autonomy. Um, they eventually sort of cry out for some kind of uh, long-lasting peace. But essentially what happens is the, the original dynasty is uh, rocked by the White Ship disaster, which kills, which kills a fairly significant percentage, a proportion rather of um, the high-ranking aristocracy of the time, and I believe also the heir, the, the heir to the throne. And so subsequently the... Um, I can't remember who it was that took over. Was it Henry the? It might have been Henry the First. I think that takes over after the uh, the death of the previous king, or it might have been. 
William the no. I'm, I'm drawing a I'm drawing a blank right now. Maybe you could check in the background, but um, essentially the the succession is completely completely disrupted, um, and so royal authority begins to disintegrate, and the throne is eventually left after uh, after the successor of the the um, white ship disaster situation basically is um, Empress Matilda, who is either the I believe she's the daughter of the uh, the previous king, but being that the Normans, uh, have... yeah, of, of Henry the First, Henry the First, yeah, I thought it was Henry the First. Mm -hmm. So Henry Henry the First is uh, is essentially the last king to maintain the royal prerogatives truly, properly, as uh, as they'd been sort of built up by the likes of William the First, and then uh, in the in it, sort of in the wake of uh, of all of this catastrophe, Matilda is left to the throne, but Stephen of Blois, uh, who is a, uh, a fairly significant noble of the time, and I believe he's the brother of Henry I, something like that, um, he instead decides to make a play for the throne himself. And he has enough, enough supporters that he's able to essentially um, successfully present a fait accompli. So, Although there is still this this entirely separate faction uh, in the form of um, uh, the Empress Matilda, who is called Empress because she is uh, she she was initially the wife of the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Emperor um, when the Holy Roman Empire is still sort of uh, you know being developed and being constructed. Um, but then she goes on to later marry, I believe it was uh, Geoffrey Plantagenet, who is the uh, the original, the original Angevin, and the one for which we we get the uh, the Angevin dynasty, and it's her son, the uh, Henry. Well, who eventually Henry the Second, who uh, continues to press her claim, even when other champions of her cause are, are sort of uh, wavering a little bit more. And so, from his initial base, first in Normandy, and uh, when when that was still an English possession, and Anjou, uh, Anjou and Maine. He continues to press on England until eventually we get the scene on the right where the the various nobles who have been, and I'll fill in more of the details about that in a second, but they, they become sort of tired of the, the situation of lawlessness and they petition King Stephen, who is himself very aged and tired after having uh, fought, fought the anarchy for so long to try and maintain his kingdom and his legitimacy, that uh, yeah, he he agrees to some kind of uh, tr treaty, but unsatisfied, Henry the Second continues to press on, or not yet Henry the Second yet, but he he continues to press on, and he puts himself in a position that he is able to um, not fully dictate terms to uh, King Stephen, but King Stephen is put into a position where he he must sort of accept lesser terms than uh, than he perhaps would have liked. And especially the uh, the sons of Stephen are not best pleased because the eventual agreement that comes out of the meeting depicted on the right here is that King Stephen will continue to rule for the rest of his life, but he will adopt King Henry. He will well, he would he will adopt Henry, who will then become the king afterwards, after Stephen's death. And unfortunately for Stephen, that uh, that death only comes one year later. But the kingdom that Henry in, in, uh, inherits is uh, still one that is very much riven by uh, significant divisions. Just before we go on, is Stephen's death natural, or was it an assassination, or what, what happened to Stephen? I believe it was a uh, it was a natural death, but uh, you know sometimes you can never be too sure. No, no, it just seems very fortuitous for Henry. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, and then you you said um, that you were going to talk a little bit about the barons and their reaction to the anarchy and why they wanted a, a strong leader, I guess, to, to come forward? Yes. So in particular, and, and again, this is the kind of, this, this is the situation that, uh, that Henry inherited. So the Northern barons in particular um, had been operating more or less at will, doing pretty much whatever they pleased because the royal authority was so omni-focused on just trying to preserve itself by any means necessary. Um, and all the while, to compound this with, uh, you know, the settling of petty feuds and uh, and general lawlessness that pervaded, that gives it the name, the anarchy. Um, you also have foreign mercenaries 
and one of the uh, one of the one of the stipulations of the treaty is that all first foreign mercenaries will be uh, will be evacuated, or you, you know will, will be removed basically from the uh, the British mainland because they were compounding onto this issue, especially due to the fact that uh, at this time the difference between something like an outlaw or a bandit and uh, a mercenary or a a loyal soldier was um, not necessarily such a clear divide, and sometimes it just depended on the circumstances whether there was war or peace and uh, to what extent they were being paid and paid on time at that. So so when when you, you're talking about the anarchy, it's not just political disintegration. On the ground, there's a lot of crime going on. And I, I guess, um, you know, the, the countryside is definitely not a safe place to go with these bandits roving around and so on. Yes, uh, especially in the north where uh, large, um, larger states are essentially being built up and, uh, and quite a lot of fortification because this is the period where, okay, so prior to this period, um, the building of a castle had to be directly approved. So you had, you had to petition mm. the king and you had to get direct permission for the castle to be built and built where you wanted it to be. During the period of the anarchy, especially because castles had become such a, and, and fortifications in general had become such a uh, an important um, both prestige symbol and, may, and means of actually reinforcing your own local power and uh you know self-aggrandizement and, and you know all, all of this kind of thing um castles just started springing up everywhere and there was absolutely nothing that the central authority could do about it especially if they were if, if, if this was happening at the periphery most definitely and i i think just i mean i i know a bit later in kind of border history but essentially you've got all these families and clans who have massive networks of um kin kin relationships which are their real loyalty it's not it's not a kind of nation thing it's okay i'm loyal to the clan chief and we'll go raiding the next door clan and take all of their cattle or so on and so forth i'm guessing that's a that's um proliferating during this period because there's no central authority to to come down like a ton of bricks upon yeah. any of that activity yeah yeah exactly so that. so so some of the anarchy so we could say some of its you know bandit gangs but it's probably also the barons who are who are behind the scenes directing some of this as well against each other and so on. Yes, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, settling personal feuds, trying to uh, increase their own, uh, their own powers. Because one of the things about uh, law at this kind of time is that uh, a, a privilege, even if it's you know, written down in law and it, even if it's, it's very well uh, attested to, if it isn't actually properly defended, then you don't really have it. And so even mm. though the king especially, and, and Henry Henry II himself finds this, um, even though he might theoretically still have all of these powers completely intact uh, in practice, if they haven't been uh, actually wielded properly for the last you know 30 plus years, then um, it does not, it's not something that's respected and it's treated as infringing on the, uh, on the, the rights of the, uh, you know, whoever, whoever you're trying to wield the privilege against. So it's very much determined by who runs the land de facto, where yes. you are. Yeah. Yes. And um, to some extent, mm. you'll sort of see this throughout history, uh, especially in, in England, is that uh, when a privilege that's held is not, is not wielded properly for a long time, uh, it also takes an equally long time for it to be reclaimed a lot of the time, because mm. the initial push to try and uh, you know, get, get all, of, all of the authority that might be rightly held by the king uh, that will be treated as uh, you know tyranny because you're you know trampling on the on the rights and privileges of the of the nobles who have sort of like gradually encroached on the borders of what the king is allowed to do or supposed to do expected to do. That's quite an interesting dynamic, actually. That so so he does have the right to it, but because de facto it's not being used, it, I, I guess it, it I guess it would be like if King Charles today tried to use some of the powers he does actually constitutionally have. He would be called t a tyrant because it's not been used by the queen, for example. Yes. So, yeah. so, yeah. I mean, that that's a very good example in that because so for so long the uh, the royal prerogative powers in particular. So, other than commanding the majority in Parliament, um, mm. the cabinet, like the government, does not actually wield any power. They merely wield royal power that is delegated to them. But if the king were to try and take all those powers back, although he legally is able to. Um, that would be treated as uh, you know beyond the pale and uh, and tyrannical. Likewise, if you were to refuse to sign a bill, then uh, it it does not become law. But if you were to if you were to use that veto, 
uh, it would likewise probably be seen as tyrannical, even though he does have that power. It's the same principle in play. So we just have to wait another 200, 300 years. That's that's what you're telling me here, Rupert. That's what I'm hearing between the words. Well, um, you do also have to have uh, men who are willing to push to push back. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's what Henry II excels at, probably more than uh, any other ruler, perhaps even in English history. Well, let, let's move on then to... You, you've described the lead up to Henry II's reign. So he's become king now, and he still faces all these problems. So what, what happens next, Rupert? The trouble is, it's uh, in a lot of ways, it's kind of difficult to really isolate what specifically is happening to, okay. to, lead, to lead him to being able to regain, regain all of these, um, uh, all these powers. Perhaps it's just a, a sort of like lack of my um, my you know full reading on the subject, and I need to uh, I need to dive in I need to dive in more. But uh, from what I've been able to find so far, there's not really that much, hmm. other than something which seems to be very key is the 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 people that he surrounds himself with, which is unfortunately something that is not necessarily transmitted very well down through the generations. So the, so there is a particular generation uh, born out of this culture that is not replicated. So in this time period, you get people like uh, William Marshall, for example, popping up. William Marshall is you know, considered in uh, a lot of English history to be one of the greatest knights of all time. And it's partly due to the, the way in which he carries himself throughout Henry II's reign and beyond that into the reign of his sons, who are uh, significantly more, what would you say, uh, treacherous, perhaps. Yeah, I think I think that's a good way to put it. Um, they, somebody like William Marshall, from what what I understand, was totally invested in the romance literature of the period, who saw himself as following the ideal of knightly virtue and chivalry, going to tournaments, becoming a champion uh, knight, but also in terms of his conduct. And certainly, in th there's an episode where um, later on Henry II is at war with his sons who have betrayed him, they want the, the powers for themselves. And he is able to unseat in battle Richard the uh, First, well, later Richard the First, Richard the Lionheart, one of the greatest warrior kings ever. He's the only man to have ever unseated Richard. But rather than slaying him, he slays his horse and lets him live. So that kind of shows the the gallantry, the honesty, the the um the virtuousness of, of somebody like Marshall. So I guess that's the sort of character that you have surrounding Henry II during this time. Yeah, Honest, honesty is the key because mm. th I think the thing that's more remarkable about uh, William Marshall and the way in which this gets crystallized into actual um, you know, like true political power and, uh, and political change is that William Marshall, despite being slighted and despite himself being perhaps perceived to slight various uh, various rulers at various times he is always loyal to his liege at, the, at that time and that might change due to circumstances usually the uh, the death of his the death of his liege but he will always remain true to whoever he is uh, whoever he's sworn to this might be a really terrible ex comparison but i think if if for those of you who don't know the period and you've seen game of thrones Ned Stark would be your best comparison, actually, because he follows his liege's will, you know, with absolute conviction. Yeah. Well, not okay. The comparison would be something like Ned Stark. If Ned Stark was uh, given the ending that uh, you know someone halfway through or most of the way through season one would uh, would want, because yes, yes. ultimately, despite all the all the slights against him, despite being um, you know humiliated in 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 court and lied to by King John later about uh, being betrayed by his um, by his knights, uh, his sworn knights in uh, in Ireland, and uh, being given permission for his lands in Ireland to be um, invaded and uh, despoiled and, uh, you know, potentially the taking captive of his, his wife and his loyal men, you know, the ones that didn't switch sides that were, that, uh, yeah, basically, Despite all of this, he remains true to King John. And despite having 
the slights against him go some way towards causing the first Baron's War, which is you know obviously one of the major rebellions against King John. Um, William Marshall is himself one of the most prominent knights who actually, despite it all, stays loyal and fights and continues fighting for King John. And his reward is significant, actually, because he is rehabilitated by King John eventually. Um, I mean, he's he's re he's rehabilitated by um, Richard the First earlier as well to sort of go back to that example that you gave earlier, and he becomes a uh, a trusted um, attendant to, uh, or you know, tr a trusted servant of uh, of Richard the First as well, especially whilst he's away on crusade. But uh, when King John is uh, is on his deathbed, uh, the essentially all royal power more more or less is uh, is invested in William Marshall as a regent. And his policy at the time is basically one of stability. He wants to try to make sure that everything is as uh, stable and um, cohesive and more or less what was given to him so that he can pass it on to uh, the young Henry III, I think it is. There's no question at all in his mind of trying to take the throne for himself. You know, no. he's, he's absolutely... He's, he, he's absolutely sincere and somebody who, as you said, like he could be relied upon by any of these kings because of his absolute loyalty to the crown. Um, what what struck me when you were when you were saying this, and we'll get back to Henry II shortly, was in a previous stream we were talking about Robin Hood, and the, you know, he was a lord or an, sorry, an, an earl who whose land was taken by Prince John, and thus he engages in this kind of uh, administering the king's justice in the absent, absence of the king. And, you know, being a pine, uh, um, an exemplar of chivalry and doing what's right and what's just, even though he has to kind of do it under a disguise as this Robin Hood. And I was just wondering, because we, we had spoken about that and how, you know, he's a character who we should elevate. And although he can't be the true knight in terms of his his context in which there isn't a, a king to uphold order, he does the best one possibly could. So then I was just thinking, well, how does that fit then with William Marshall's absolute loyalty to the crown when, you know, Hood is in rebellion, you might say, or at least resistance to the to um, Prince John, who's acting wrongly as the de facto monarch, whereas William Marshall stays, stays loyal. What would you say to that tension, Rupert? Uh, I would say there is. I mean, it, William Marshall basically comes into this into this uh, problem himself because he is, like I said, left to be. Uh, helping to administer the realm in the absence of Richard I uh, while he's away on crusade. Um, and in that capacity, he is subordinated to uh, John, you know, the future King John. But once he realizes that uh, King, well, the, the, that the Regent John is not uh, upholding the wishes and the, um, the sort of desires of Richard and that acting in his own interest, um, William Marshall does start working against him, which you know might be you could potentially perceive that as a uh, as a besmirching of his uh, his honor and his good character as and his reputation for uh, for loyalty to whoever he's serving at the present moment. But um, the way that I read it, um, you know, as, and I'm sure the way that he would see it himself is that he was not sworn to um, he was not yet sworn to John. He was sworn to Richard, and so when he saw uh, future King John working against against his liege, essentially, and against the wishes of his liege in the form of the king, then he continues to uphold the will of the king, even though the king is not present. So very much like Robin Hood in that regard as well. Yeah. You could say, yeah, you can see the comparison there. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I think they're analogous characters in this regard. Mm. Well, and probably an inspiration, actually, when you think about it. Um, but then, so, ha so c t returning back to Henry II, um, you know, we, we've said that he's the he's surrounded by these sorts of characters like William Marshall, who um, 
are who have this absolute honesty and sincerity. And of course, this is going to help with the reestablishment of order within the kingdom. But and I, I know it's difficult to say specifically what events make that possible. But is there general trends then that that are being brought about by these sorts of individuals? Yes. Yeah, so I, another thing that I think uh, sort of illustrates the same trend, and, and which is what makes me think of it more as a trend rather than the individual virtue of someone like William Marshall. You know, although he might ex express, he might be the expression of this um, this trend in its purest form. Um, you do also have the um, the knights that killed Thomas Beckett. And I know that's a that's a, a curious uh, thing to bring up, but I think it, it sort of illustrates this environment in which the king's enemies are, you know, it, it doesn't actually need to be specifically stated. There does not need to be an order passed down through any kind of like uh, official hierarchy. It, it is merely enough for the king to express his will that something happen and then that men loyal to him will take it upon themselves to see it done. Even if ultimately it's not what he would want. As would as it would probably be accurate to say, you know, considering what he pays later for for the uh, for the crime, um, I think it would probably be quite accurate to say that he he didn't want the killing of Thomas Beckett, but um, you know, it happened nonetheless just because of his expression of displeasure. I, th I think as well that the the death of Thomas Beckett, well, the the conflict between Henry and Beckett is quite interesting because it does reveal. There's this this one of the things that Henry seems to do is he expands the power of the royal judicial court. That is, as we've been kind of alluding to before, the legal system prior, it really was that your local baron gets to judge but on a case. And so therefore it can be quite arbitrary. What rules are applied, what rules aren't. And certainly there's no degree of kind of uniformity across the country in that regard. Whereas Henry well, he, he starts to have more cases himself, but he also sends out various justiciars to go around the country, basically administering royal justice. And so you start then to have the formation of a series of courts around the country who are administering a common law. And something like the Treatise of Granville will codify many of these uh, precedents that are being established through these courts. So that seems to me to be one of the ways in which he he tries to address this um, anarchy is by having a common system of law across the country, which is being brought in by his legal men. He's also punishing um, thieves quite strongly, so taking away all of their property. I think there's also several executions during this period. Um, and this is all also taking power away from the barons to administer their own realms. They're becoming more and more dependent upon the legal system of the crown. So again, this high-low against the middle dynamic coming into play. Uh, Rupert. Yeah, I, I think the key thing, though, is that he's not actually doing much of this as, as reform from his own mind, as far as I can mm. tell. He is basically trying to restore the prerogatives of Henry I, his grandfather. And that's that's what he is like. That's the blueprint that he's working from. He's not um, he's not trying to you know come up with the idea that there should be a unified uh, legal system. He is he is simply saying we once had a, un a unified legal system, and I would like to you know restore that because that is my that is my inheritance from my grandfather. Hmm. So he he's bringing back or restoring Henry the First reign essentially. Yeah. He is yeah. he, he is trying to restore the royal administration back to. Uh, Back to what it was in uh, in all regards mm. but i think the thing that is sort of smoothing the way for him is uh, again his personal gravitas his personal um power in the sense that you know he does also he, he can he has considerable personal resources for one thing and he has a lot of uh, you know men that are loyal to him and so through a, you know, through a combination of all of these things, his personal, personal presence and gravitas uh, allows him to propel these things through because it's not, it's not necessarily seen as the same kind of infringement when it's being uh, administered by someone who's seen as a just ruler. And, and this, this gravitas that you've been mentioning, does, is this similar to Aurelian then that he was leading his own military campaigns and so on? Is that where that's, that's coming from essentially? I would say that, yeah, that that's, that's part of it. And, um, 
the fact that some of his um, some of his successors, uh, you know, in the form of his sons, seem to try to maintain this kind of um, some of these kinds of reforms, especially John, I think, as far as I can tell, is trying to push this same centralization of uh, of royal power uh, against the barons. But he is not able to do it from the same position of uh, you know, personal gravitas and ability to command loyalty. But I think the other key thing is that, like I said earlier, um, there's a particular there's a generation here of uh, a very of men who perhaps experienced either the anarchy outright or the afterglow of the anarchy, mm -hmm. perhaps, and they uh, sort of came to appreciate what a uh, what a great king could could bring to the table, especially when they experienced one in the form of uh, Henry II. So. You know, they, yeah. they had this sort of dual comparison. And like you said, there's another thing, another very key thing uh, and very important to our interests that I want to bring up, which is that Henry II was one of the uh, first English kings to really uh, steep himself back into the mythology of King Arthur and the whole King Arthur mythos and repopularizes it and ma makes a very conscious effort to portray himself as the returned King Arthur to... Um, you know, res restore order to the realm, basically. How, how does he go about doing that? Well, the, the main thing is just that the um, the texts themselves are repopularized. So as you as as you may know, um, curiously, the um, the tales themselves were translated into French uh, through popularization among the troubadours, I believe it was. And then from there, the you know the various romances that you mentioned, among them among them were were some of the um, the Arthurian like cycle mythos. They were all sort of rolled into uh, this sort of like wider uh, you know like worldview of, uh, of of Arthurian legend and Arthurian uh, romance. And then that was patronized at court to some extent, or, or popularized by people who are associated with court. And thus it was, uh, you know, it, it was something that was sort of steeped into the culture that uh, that the children were being brought up in. So like you said, William Marshall himself was was brought up in this kind of culture. But, uh, you know, basically everyone was when it was being patronized from the top. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I think um, it's, it's useful just, just for one name, which might be helpful for folks is Geoffrey of Monmouth. Is writing his history of the kings of britain during this period yeah, so exactly. you know that's the sort of story that people are reading we we were discussing albina and brutus earlier uh you know a few weeks ago but it, it also includes king arthur and his building of a essentially a a, a british empire uh under him uh, that extends across scotland wales ireland and france and we see that dynamic with henry too that he's able to build something like that. Um, but before before that, we move, uh, sorry, Rupert, go ahead. Go not ahead. only that, but he, but in in that, uh, so in in the Monmouth uh, Chronicles, there are also great conquests happening in Gaul. Hmm. Yes. Something to bear in mind. Yeah, that's a good point. So we have this parallel in in the story that people are reading are being brought up with, and then Henry gets to go and fulfill that vision. Yes. Essentially. Yes. yes. Exactly. And and, and the knights. The knights that are being raised up around him, um, all of which are, you know, quite um, notable in their own right because they have this uh, often quite rock hard ethic, um, mm. you know, under underpinning and, and, and uh, you know, virtue underpinning what they're doing. Like men like William Marshall, he shines through the brightest, but uh, he's not the only one. Um, he, he's he's very much not in terms of his romantic exploits, but in terms of he, like he's a champion at tournaments across across Europe. He's well known across Europe as this great knight who's able to, you know, do the jousting and so on. I think he he estimated he defeated astounding number. It, so it is that kind of he could have belonged at the the round table. Yeah, exactly. This is this mm -hmm. is the culture in which new knights are being brought up, but then somewhere along the way that sort of gets. Uh, Either corrupted or forgotten, and uh, and that the subsequent generation of knights that are brought up are far more um, coveting, you could perhaps say, or you know, vicious, as in, you know, filled with uh, with various vices that uh, that lead them to, mm. you know, even Henry the Second's own sons who are tearing tearing the uh, the empire apart with civil wars, and uh, turning turning all of his family against him, including his own wife, um, in all of these conflicts, just basically because. 
he's not handing over he's not handing them over enough power and he's living too long so they're not able to um you know strike it out on their own as uh hmm. as kings in their own right because even his and heir is re rebelling against him and uh, ju just before we get to then his his empire and you know the eventual civil war or civil wars the um it should be mentioned as well that henry um it, he he finds the grave of Arthur at Glastonbury Tor, Arthur and Guinevere with the sword of Excalibur, and he becomes a patron of a um, monks who are kind of dedicated to that as a shrine. Um, and I, I think that ties into it again. It's this it's a physical manifestation. He's found he's found Arthur, as it were. He's found Avalon, and he's bringing that back to the whole kingdom. Yeah, exactly. And this, this is exactly the kind of patronage I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So, so then, how does he? So he, he he's kind of restoring the the legal order within the kingdom. He's restoring the moral order as well, and tying it in with the mythological. How does he restore it in terms of its territory? Well, he is he already inherits uh, quite a significant. Um, well, quite a significant set of holdings, basically, um, when he is able to... So he, he inherits Normandy first, uh, and then he acquires... Uh, well, he, in he inherits uh, Anjou and Maine. He then uh, manages to regain the Kingdom of England itself, begins to re-establish order at the peripheries there, including over Wales. Um, and he marries uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and she brings along significant holdings around Aquitaine. Um, so that, so basically, if you if you were to look at a map of the uh, the Angevin Empire, essentially the um, the period after he has completed some of his earlier conquests in Ireland, in particular, and obtained the um, suzerainty over, I can't remember who it was. The um, the Duke of Brittany, I believe it was. I can't remember his name. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, from there, he is also able to to keep um, pressing on into France because he's uh, he's undergoing conflict with France due to the original uh, oaths of fealty that he uh, he made when he was just the uh, Duke of Normandy uh and anjou and maine so when he was still just a, essentially just a french subject um he made various oaths, oaths of uh fealty and uh he you know there's there's a lot of con uh, conflict over that essentially um but he always in the early days comes out on top and it's only when um the empire starts coming apart due to some of these civil wars that uh the problems start start emerging obviously. And then at that point, the uh, the various, well, the, the empire doesn't truly start coming apart under his reign, I don't believe. I think it's only later because all of this strength is then still able to be uh, inherited by the likes of um, Richard I, especially, who is going to divert quite a lot of these resources away into, um, uh, into the Holy Land, and you know he takes a lot of uh, you know fine fighting men of England over to the Holy Land, and he achieves great things. But ultimately, it comes to to some extent at the cost of um, stability at home, because while he is away, and while the coffers are being drained of uh, England and the Angevin Empire, Louis in France, I think it's Louis, is trying to um, you know you know nip at his heels basically and uh, and try to take what he can so i mean henry really expands the hit the the borders of the territory that then even further than somebody like william the conqueror would have had uh yes yeah by by quite a lot um and and even later when you're talking about the uh the hundred years war period um mm. Although the actual blood claim to the throne of France is is coming from a slightly different source, the uh, the territories that are being claimed are, are many of these same 
many of these same regions, albeit uh, in reduced form quite often. So, uh, you know, Aquitaine in particular and Normandy and, uh, you know, later Anjou and Maine as well, I believe. Mm. I mean, it's absolutely massive. It's half of modern day France. It's, yeah. Uh... At the time, I believe they, they own more of France than, uh, well, the, the, than the French uh, throne itself could command, especially because a lot of those uh, various nobles, a lot of those various blue polities there are either you know, outright autonomous or you know, mostly autonomous to the extent that the uh, French king is not able to reliably uh, count on their doing his bidding if he, if he asks them. And so he, he also had a fair part of Ireland here. Um, it's, it's a, I thought he had more of Wales than this map suggests, but uh, it certainly has a bit of Wales. Did he have much of Scotland at all? Because you, you mentioned at the beginning his, his influence certainly reached into Scotland. Yes. Um, I don't remember the exact uh, chronology of when uh, when he picked up part of it, but um, I remember especially in the resolution to one of the um, one of the rebellions against him by his uh, by his sons predominantly, and a number of barons, uh, you know, allied barons. Um, he confiscated uh, Edinburgh and another castle from them. Uh, and so, you know, obviously by extension, he would have to have, they would have to have controlled that in the first place. Yes, yes. And uh, I mean, that's interesting too, because you can see that as a restoration because traditionally Edinburgh actually came under the kingdom of Northumbria, uh, yeah. the Saxon kingdom. So it's, do, you could argue de jure is actually part of England. Um, and I, I know many Glaswegians who say as much anyway. Um, I'll, but, uh, I'll make a mental note of that. <laughs> um, so how how does the civil war then break out for Henry? Uh, so, like I said, um, it's it's essentially an issue of his uh, children not being uh, given the opportunities that they want. Um, well, coming back to William Marshall, even he uh, was fighting against uh, against the king uh, Henry the Second in some of these earlier. Uh, was the uh, the Great Revolt, I think it's called especially, um, which included uh, Eleanor, Richard I, I believe his son Joffrey, and also the the younger Henry, who was who was at the time ruling as a, as co ruler in theory. Um, essentially, a lot of these conquests in Ireland, especially, were were being concocted um, in order to give them some kind of like more more prestige and more opportunity and more lands and more power and all of that kind of thing to try to placate them but you know ultimately that doesn't uh, that doesn't succeed and uh, and they they just they want more basically and so they try to they try to revolt against him um but it is ultimately some, uh, unsuccessful and so there are various uh, punitive well not 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 particularly punitive actually they they they're essentially forgiven not like nobody none of these um figures are um Particularly severely punished, but uh, especially because then you know they're not killed and they're not totally dispossessed. Especially probably especially due to the fact that they are uh, you know close family to Henry II himself. But um, obviously it, it shakes shakes the empire quite a bit, and at that point it, it can't really expand that much further. And and the the issue of these various civil wars breaking out all the time is. Uh, is something because I think it, Richard the First in particular leads another one later after the uh, the younger Henry is killed, and this is when, as you said, um, the uh, so William Marshall un unseats Richard the First from his horse, or the, the later Richard the First from his horse is during the second this uh, second major rebellion. But um, yeah, essentially, this just consumes too much of the uh, the resources of Henry the of Henry to for him to be able to. Really continue in the same the same kind of momentum pushing into France that he was uh, that he was able to earlier. And so, how do, how does this lead towards the end of Henry? Uh, it, does he die in this conflict, or does he have a natural death, or uh, and and how does that tie into his legacy? Um, I believe ultimately he has a natural death, actually. Um, uh, but essentially, the issue is that the. Um, well, his children don't change. Basically, they they've been raised uh, in into this uh, you know this kind of I don't know whatever kind of atmosphere it was that was uh, that was having them be so dissenting and so rebellious is something that is sort of passed on to the 
the barons, it seems, and uh, eventually the culmination of that is, I suppose, ironically enough, under under one of his sons, one of his more rebellious sons, John. Um, he, um, I, th I think, John joined into the, into many of the rebellions, but yeah, essentially, after Richard the First's death, and it passes to uh, to John to be king, um, he faces another one of these kinds of rebellions, and uh, he is not able to put it down sufficiently that. Um, He's he's forced to come to terms basically, at um, I believe it is, is it Runny Mead at Magna Carta. Mead, yes, yes, yes. I thought so. Um, and yeah, so he's forced to uh, to make this this pronouncement about the um, the you know, you know, the rights of the no nobility basically, and uh, and certain limits on his royal prerogative power. And so that you could probably call the uh, mm. the fairly definitive end to the legacy of uh, Henry the Second. The retraction or the turning back towards the nobility's power yes, rather than exactly. the thrones yeah yeah i mean ultimately some of the some of the power is uh is regained under i believe it's henry the third um so he's able to successfully resubjugate a lot of the uh the nobility and the barons on uh, in the second barons war hmm. but um <clears throat> Uh, but but yeah, ultimately he he then chooses to re-promulgate the uh, uh, Magna Carta under his own you know mag magnanimity, um, perhaps thinking that you know that it was a a shrewd political move to uh, you know get get people on side who might be um, holdouts and uh, you know un unreformed rebels basically, or at least to separate the hardcore rebels from uh, from people who 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 might be uh, who might be swayed by a bit of clemency. So again, we see that kind of dynamic we saw with Aurelian, the the ability to distinguish who needs to be killed and who can be shown mercy, um, yeah. with the threat of violence behind it. Um, so so again, I, th I think we're at a good point where we should maybe move on to our next uh, next figure. But before we do, just giving people a chance to to ask any comments or questions specifically on Henry. Is there anything else that you would add to our discussion of Henry the Second and his restoration of England? Or in some ways, really, it's not just a restoration; his formation of England as well at the same time. Yeah, so I would I would probably argue that uh, Henry the Second represents one of the, so especially in his uh, his cultural uh, patronage represents a um, a start of a period of uh, Anglicization in a way, in the sense of uh, you know the the ethnogenesis of the English, which is more completely and more deliberately pursued. Well, it's it's quite deliberate here as well, but um, it's it's a very deliberate policy and very uh, very calculated in the case of Edward III. But um, but the Plantagenets are very deliberately this this attempt to come out, come in, despite being you know somewhat Norman, as an outside party to the Norman Anglo-Saxon divide and try to sort of create something that is uh, that is going to, going to be like a unifying quality. And I think that's you know if you, if you're going to be very cynical about it, then um, that is probably part of the reason why part of the reason why they chose to patronize a mythological vision of themselves, which was neither fully Anglo-Saxon nor fully Norman. As in with Arthur. Yeah, it, it, it was mm. Brythonic. Yes, yes, and so they they get to tie themselves to the original peoples of the of Britain. Yeah, um, essentially, yeah. And I'm sure um, it also it also had some. Uh, uh, helpful implications for uh, trying to maintain alliances with the likes of Brittany and uh, mm. oh, most certainly. And of course, given Arthur's own own heritage mythologically from Brutus, it's the very foundations of the very kingdom uh, and the establishment of order from chaos. So you can see that kind of cycle cycle once again. Um, and yeah, I, I and, and maybe th this is just a little little comment at the end though is that we see we see with Henry, although he's able to bring about a centralizing towards the power of the crown, the establishment of legal and moral order, much like Arthur's own family is ultimately his his downfall. In a similar way, Henry's family is a court basically brings a, an end to his momentum and certainly um reintroduces chaos back into back into the country so there's i obviously it wasn't intentional but they 
they kind of parallel each other maybe too far in terms of the story yeah mm -hmm. I, yeah i i can't imagine that's uh entirely deliberate on the part of the sons but uh, it is something it is certainly a very curious um parallel to draw yeah there's probably some kind of deep significance in that that needs to be explored at some point um but uh we should move on and I was going to propose, Rupert, because I realise we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes just now, and we've only gone through two. What I'm proposing is maybe we could do one more tonight, and then maybe we could have a, a second stream where we could look at a few other figures as well, because I found it absolutely fascinating. And yeah, I think I there to. might be... I, I think rather than rushing two of our figures, it'd be better to do do one now fully, and then another we can give another another stream to. Uh, so do you have a preference which of our two further figures you would like to look at tonight? Uh, I would say in line in line with this idea of uh, the first, which the, the first almost like totally successful um, mm. restoration, the second mostly successful for a time, but ultimately failed. The third could perhaps be uh, you know, failed outright, but you can sort of see the uh, the outlines of grace uh, of greatness. So uh, that seems most appropriate to me. Uh, well, it seems most appropriate to me to have a look at uh, Fedor Arthurovich Keller. Let's do it. Let's do it. So take us away with this this fellow moving forward another um, several centuries forward now. Yeah. So Keller is very. Uh, He's probably one of the more interesting ones to cover on this stream, and it's it's almost a shame that it's taken us so long to uh, to get to him because uh, we run the risk of of uh, some other people not being able to um, to hear so much about him. But um, yeah, he's he's a he's a fascinating figure that is that is quite unknown, I would say, uh, due to the fact that he, like I said, he he essentially gives it a very good go, and he is somebody who, in another time, in another world, in another place, had thought, had one or two things gone slightly differently, he could have been one of the all-time heroes of Russia. But as is, he is a somewhat forgotten um, forgotten figure who um, whose, whose ultimate impact was uh, kind of more what could have been. So he comes from uh, German aristocracy, I believe, uh, as is potentially uh, inferable from his name, but he was quite a staunch um, Russian nationalist, essentially, or more... More properly, he's a czarist loyalist, uh, and he is so incredibly loyal to the czar and lo and loyal to the uh, the stability of the um, uh, the, Ru the Russian Empire, rather. That uh, he, for one thing, he he disobeys his parents. That's a, a pretty interesting start. In that he is so committed to the to the idea of service to Russia especially in the armed forces that he disobeys his parents he just sort of disappears on them and then um joins the uh joins the army even though he's doing so out of uh, cadet school but he wants to take part in the ongoing war which i believe is the um uh, the great russo turkish war of 1874 75 i want to say um so the uh, the sort of greatest war against the Turks, where the uh, the Russians are almost able they they do most of the job of um, sort of uh, liberating the Balkans, and they they essentially cripple Turkey to the point where it it, it sort of well not Turkey you know the Ottomans of the time, and they are never never quite fully able to um, re restore themselves. But uh, he comes into contact there with a figure who may or may not have had some some impact on him. Another quite fervent. Um, and uh, potentially loyalist figure uh, called uh, Mikhail Skobolev. And that he's, he's a whole other uh, sort of question mark in himself because he is a figure who was probably the most um, accomplished, especially uh, aggressive and offensive military general of his generation uh, in, the, in the Russian um, staff. But unfortunately, he dies prematurely and... Uh, he is, and many of his compatriots are the ones who then go on to uh, lose the Russo-Japanese War and and later uh, World War, and don't perform particularly well in uh, World War One. 
So yeah, another what great what could have been. Keller himself uh, serves with, um, well, I, I don't think he's ever actually uh, sent particularly far east. Um, he's uh, during the Russo-Japanese War. I believe he's kept uh, more or less uh, on retainer. And he does the, the duty of stabilizing during the 1905 Russian Revolution that follows. And this is where he gains quite a lot of his, uh, well, notoriety among revolutionaries, fame among uh, Russian loyalists, uh, because he very uh, expertly puts down rebellions in one of the most rebellious areas of the Russian Empire at the time, which is uh, Poland. So he's in southern Poland. Um, is, is he the command? So he's the commander of that that force which puts down the rebellion. Yes, uh, and he basically mm. he basically does so by um, well, at one point he he confronts a load of uh, a load of protesters um, who are who are sort of trying to riot uh, or, and like you know like gin up some kind of like movement during all the all the tumult. Um, but he basically just points back to his uh, points back to his soldiers that are with him, his mounted uh, cavalrymen. Uh, and you know, sabers drawn, weapons drawn, and uh, and says, "Do you see what's behind me? Get out of here!" Something to that effect. <laughs> and that is enough to uh, disperse the crowd. So again, this principle of using the threat of violence without needing to resort to it, knowing yeah. you can. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's also another instance where um, a uh, a bomb is thrown. Uh, I can't remember if it was at him or at someone else because he was the military governor of the region at the time. So uh, I think he was he's a very viable target. Um, and it does uh, it explodes next to him, uh, we, uh, injures his leg quite badly. But uh, he is strong enough of, of uh, character that he sort of like stays stays awake and conscious long enough to uh, to order his troops around and try to make sure that there wouldn't be too uh, severe. Um, reactions and um, what's the word? Reprisals. Reprisals. That's the word. Yes. Reprisals yeah. against uh, against everyone around him when when he eventually had to go for uh, for medical treatment. Hmm. And ever after he uh, he walks with a limp. So so he he gains this fame across Russia at this point for his exploits in this region, and I guess he brings he he does eventually bring stability to. To that region of Poland, he does. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that that area calms down quite quickly. Um, eventually, the entire revolution is uh, is brought to heel through um, events that are probably too uh, too complicated to fully go to go, go into here. That we can we can if we have the time. Um, F feel free, feel free. Give it its full due. Well, I'll, I'll okay. I'll I'll give it at least a uh, a quick overview. Um, essentially, the the army is uh, is brought back. Um, military governance is established. Revolutionaries are, uh, you know, rounded up where they are in the streets. And on the back end, the Okrana, the Tsarist secret police, are uh, activated to, you know, basically just arrest everybody. Um, because previously to that, their, their policy had been one of trying to sort of mani manipulate from the edges. So they would infiltrate all these different groups. They would gather gather information, try to guide. The, uh, the revolutionaries in directions that are sort of more fav favorable to the state. Um, but on the outbreak of the revolution, they all just sort of spring into action and, uh, you know, gather up, gather up everyone basically and just issue mass arrests and, uh, and get everyone in jail and uh, away from their, their organizations and their organizing. Um, on top of that, though, there are some, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Concessions that are made by the Tsar. So he issues uh, the October decrees or the October manifesto. I can't, I can't remember what the exact term, term is, um, which is essentially just uh, promising a whole load of um, uh, reforms that would try to move Russia in a more democratic direction. And uh, October manifesto, that's right. October yeah. manifesto. And uh, agrees to the establishment of a Duma. Uh, much to his uh, later regret, I'm sure, but um, you know the Duma being the uh, the Imperial Russian Parliament, um, and originally it, it is able to maintain to to wield some some degree of power, and especially they uh, the the first assembly of the uh, the Duma comes uh, comes with uh, some pretty high hopes 
But mm. by that point, because the revolutionary movement has been uh, has been so thoroughly defanged forcefully uh, by people like Keller, but also other um, Tsarist loyalists in the army and um, you know various other figures in the government who were still uh, willing to you know loyalists in in the government as well. Um, they're able to basically bring everything under control to the extent that uh, yeah the, the threat of actual overwhelming force in like a revolutionary manner is, has been you know more or less quelled, uh, and so yeah the these are basically able to ignore them more or less. And uh, in I think it's uh, 1907, 1906 or nineteen oh seven something like that the um, uh, loyalists under Stolypin, I believe, um, mm -hmm. essentially coup the government, and uh, they 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 run things more or less by uh, by Tsarist dictate. And the the Duma still exists, and it still has some of its um, some of its pretense of having a role, but ultimately it it reverts to a purely um, advisory body. So what you know, you you've said that the the revolutionaries were totally crushed essentially by Keller and men like him. The military yeah. wins. Yes. So why why do does the Tsar make these concessions of the Duma? Um, and the reason why I ask that is when you know this is, this is a very different context. But if we look at like uh, devolution in Britain, uh, Gordon Brown believed if we devolve powers to the various regions, so Scotland gets its own Parliament which can deal with domestic issues, that will get rid of the desire for independence. But instead, it's just kind of been a stepping stone to inflame it. It's actually, you know, the, the fact that we've moved a step towards independence has meant more people are, are supporting independence now. So it strikes me that, okay, maybe the revolution, revolution in the immediate term has been crushed. But by giving a Duma, you're giving the sense like, okay, maybe there is a possibility of moving towards a more democratic regime rather than saying, no, we're not going to have any of it. So why why would he make that sort of concession? Um, you could potentially say that he panicked. I, I, I'm you know I'm not, okay. I'm not sure specifically. Um, perhaps it was just a measure because one you know one thing to bear in mind is that I believe the uh, October Manifesto is issued at the worst of the troubles, uh, mm. and then after that the crackdowns are able to start start taking effect to a greater extent. So even if you're only getting some amount of people, you know, if you're only getting like fifty percent of people off the street for a week, that's enough time, right? Maybe that was the thinking. Maybe that's how it worked. But ultimately, um, the um, f for one thing, the, the the earlier promise that something would be uh, we issued by the by the czar because it wasn't. I don't think it was issued uh, sort of like unilater unilaterally out of nowhere. There was uh, there were there was announcements beforehand that it would be that there would be something, uh, and so that was able to put a pause on the sort of. You might say the more the, the less radical of the revolutionaries, because there were some people who were, you know, obviously maximalists and wanting to just get everything that they could, and there were others who were um, who were a little bit more of the the mind that uh, you know if we can just get some of what we want, then um, then that's good that's good enough in the short term, and if you can just give enough of those people pause. For you know, dying for their uh, their ideals, then you know maybe that's maybe that's enough in the short term. That may have been part of the thinking, but ultimately, yes, the Duma does come come back around to be uh, a massive pain in the rear to uh, to the Tsar later on. And uh, the the main thing is that it becomes a a hotbed for figures to become prominent Tsarist opposition and do so in a way that made it hard to subject them to the same kind of. Um, Punitive, well, and yeah, not well. Surveillance is the main thing, really. It became harder mm. to surveil them. It became harder to um, arrest them because they had to be removed from office. I think before they could be arrested, even if they, even if the oh, Akrana right. knew that they were, you know, organizing revolutionary activity and and doing treasonous things. I believe the um, the Akrana still had to, you know, go through go through it like an entirely different process for trying to get rid of them. And so there were several figures who they knew were organizing against the Tsar. But couldn't really do anything about it until uh, until it was too late, basically, because they were legally protected. Yeah, and contrary yeah. to what you might have heard, the uh, the Okrana was actually a highly legalistic uh, body. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe maybe to its detriment. Uh, well, it's, uh, for the Tsar's detriment, anyway. But um, so so Keller is involved in putting this down. Like Aurelian, like Henry the Second, he's bringing order to the chaos, and he's highly um, kind of praised and known for this activity at this time. So what what is his trajectory after this revolution? Well, he he takes part in. Uh, World War One, and does so with a fairly good amount of um, uh, success. But there's really not that much about him. Uh, there's there's only one uh, sort of massive biography in Russian about him, uh, and otherwise he just sort, sort of shows up in uh, you know, almost like the footnotes of, uh, of other people's stories in a way. But you know, reading reading between the lines, there's quite a lot that you can draw out about him um, because he was a sort of popular figure amongst. Uh, Amongst the emigre community, but um, he didn't. So, so he he did serve with some amount of distinction in World War One. But uh, of course, his main uh, his main claim to fame comes back when the Tsar abdicates, or well, actually slightly slightly before the Tsar abdicates. So we can go through some of that. But it does require a little bit of speculation on my part. I must admit. That's no problem. I was I was just going to to mention before that point though that I think he was awarded. A number of um, honors for his his service in World War One. Um, he was ordered a, a medal from the Order of Saint George um, yep. twice, so 1914 and 1915. Is that is that quite a high military honor in the in the Russian uh, military at that point? Uh, I believe so. Yes, um, I think mm. so. Th there are those awards, um, but there is also perhaps uh, much more particularly much more relevant to the story later um he is awarded among other things a sword uh, by the czar himself uh, and he ends up uh, joining the czar's household i believe uh, like the household guard so he's really esteemed for his military action in world war 1 yeah. in addition to what he's already done and i'm guessing i i'm just guessing was he commanding troops in world war 1 as well Yes, um, yes, he was. Yeah. Um, and it becomes relevant, uh, incredibly relevant later on, because um, during the process of the Troubles, when uh, the disturbances are first breaking out in uh, Petrograd, St. Petersburg, at the time, um, you know, that you would mark the start of the February Revolution, there is a general in the north, the one that is most close to St. Petersburg, um, and incidentally, the commanding officer of Keller. His name is General Nikolai Ruski. And he, we can say in retrospect, is a, a bit of a treacherous figure because despite being ordered to send cavalry troops, which I think is quite noteworthy, sp he specifically requests cavalry, and quite a large amount of cavalry to be sent to uh, Petrograd to quell the unrest. Despite having, despite order uh, issuing this order, this direct order, it never actually is carried out. My speculation is that due to the um, reputation of Keller as being a, for one thing, highly respected figure as a uh, like a military policeman type and a discipline disciplinarian and a cavalry commander. It stands to reason that this specific general being asked, who is the commanding officer of Keller, is being asked between the lines to send Keller and uh, and cavalry troops to quell the unrest, knowing that A, those troops would be loyal, the, the cavalry troops th that are being uh, sent would be loyal, B, the commander would be loyal, and C, that the uh, the task would be carried out to its fullest, uh, to its fullest necessary extent. I mean, that that's a, to me, that's the best explanation of the situation given Keller's own leadership of cavalry in World War One and so on. Uh, so, so Ruski was sympathetic to the revolutionaries then? It would I seem guess. that way, or at, at the very least, he was sympathetic to the idea that uh, getting rid of the Tsar would uh, would improve the situation. And this mm. uh, this assertion is is uh, further encouraged by the fact that uh, Ruski is himself within the train car when Nicholas II is finally being pressed into his uh, into his abdication. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. I think it might even be risky. That's the one that's uh, pressing his hand directly to the uh, the paper to actually, you know, sign 
signed the application, but I'm not quite sure. Mm. I don't I don't remember specifically who was doing that, but uh, yeah, one of them did. I definitely read that somewhere. So yeah, I, I've I've come across that idea that Ruski was the one that was doing it. So is it? I mean, would Keller have even known about this order if it had gone to Ruski? Would he have kept that secret no. from him? No, it, it was right. kept secret. It was never issued to him. Um, and in particular, when the order is, uh, or you know, when the announcement is read that the uh, the Tsar has abdicated, Keller is actually one of two, one of only two officers in all of the Russian Empire who refuses the abdication. Oh wow! And essentially appeals wow. to Nicholas to uh, you know re reconsider and uh, not go through with it. And and so I guess um, from that point, then Keller refuses the abdication. He also refuses the oath, the the new oath of allegiance, and so he does. is booted out of his uh, out of office essentially. He is eventually yes, but mm -hmm. before then, it is actually quite noteworthy that he maintains very strong discipline among his troops, who mm. stay in uh, you know good morale basically. Um, and because after that. After this, he the the, the um, well, he, you know, he separated from his uh, from his cavalry troops. It's noteworthy to to note that the the cavalry that he commands uh, and the the units in particular that he commands are some of the ones that become most core to the uh, the Southern Volunteer Army Force, which is the uh, mm -hmm. the the one that has some of the most um, dramatic success in the south uh, in the uh, in the Caucasus Front, not the Caucasus, yeah, yeah, in the uh, the North Caucasus Front. So they're extremely well drilled and trained, and uh, have that fighting spirit still left over from Keller, even without him being there. Not only that, but they they maintain their discipline and their uh, mm. their loyalty to uh, the former Russia, not the uh, the new Soviet, you know, Bolshevik Russia that was being created. It's it's almost like he, uh, you know, if we, we, to put it back into the medieval period that we were talking about before, he is like an Arthur with his with his own cavalry, his own knights. And they stick to the task. They're, they're yeah. honest and sincere and absolute in what they're doing, even though the rest of the military is absolutely crumbling everywhere. All of its officers are crumbling. And, you know, except the Tsar's abdication, they don't. They stand firm to it. Yes. But not, not only that, uh, at least in the previous case, there was both the, uh, the background culture and mm. the uh, you know loyalty to the leader, who were both projecting the same message of uh, you know loyalty and duty and virtue. In this case, you have the the central government and uh, often you know agitators in and around the army saying something that is quite opposite to what Keller is saying, and they stand by they stand by Keller's vision and they stand by Keller's discipline. And with the Tsar himself having abdicated too, yes, which is everything yeah. is telling them everything is telling them that they should. Uh, do other than uh, than what they end up doing, and yet they stand by old Russia. The uh, you could see that as then again this Robin Hood idea of the king's absence. We still maintain or still fight for that order and justice until he returns in one form or another. I guess it's that idea which Keller has imbibed in his men, and he himself continues in in later events. Yes, because one thing that. Uh... That causes him to sort of break ranks with a lot of his uh, other officers who are who are very disdainful towards the um, the revolution is um, that he he doesn't compromise uh, what he actually stands for in order to stand against Bolshevism. So his demand is that whatever uh, whatever movement is used is roused against Bolshevism, it cannot be the uh, you know the provisional government movement of uh, of Kerensky and the other revolutionaries who originally overthrew the Tsar. It must be a res restoration in full of both the Tsar, his authority, and beyond that, his uh, you know the, the the full the full dominion, uh, inclusive of uh, you know every territory that was that, that he swore to protect and uphold. So it, it would be a full restoration then. Yes, nothing less. It's not, just a, it's not just a little part of it. It's the territory, it's the politics, it's the whole system will be... And, and surely the morality as well that's imbibed with the, that sort of um, uh, czarist Russia. It yes. all has to come together. Um, yes. 
so so i guess that would be orthodox christianity as well um yes yeah so so this then plays out later on because he's actually kind of brought back in to to in this regard eventually he is yes because when the when there is a, a lot of sort of early momentum behind the whites um mm. you know which is kind of re represented on this uh, on this graph on the right this is not quite the uh the si the situation um you know when when keller's first put in his position but um he is initially contacted and basically eventually given a uh like, like carte blanche to form a government out of the i want to say the western and north northwestern districts as it had been set up because mm. if you can see how it, how things are sort of split up um there's the northern front in the uh the sort of like um the off blue kind of character uh, color uh you know allies in czechoslovakia which is up near uh, archangel and the uh uh what's that called the the Karelian isthmus and uh, sort of like all around that area uh, and then east of that you have the wide open area of siberia which is which is all in blue controlled by the white forces and that was the uh the sort of more easterly front under kolchak and the uh the government there i can't remember specifically what it was called eventually he became the supreme leader but um you know the, the supreme leader of the uh, uh all russian white movement but um yeah there was also the southern volunteer army in the north Caucasus, uh next to you know just to the uh, the sort of east of crimea there and then there's a massive section of white uh, of uh, white force to the west of that and that's basically everything that he was eventually uh put in charge of so covering a lot of uh modern day ukraine that they controlled uh belarusia uh, uh estonia and latvia all of those kinds of areas but he would have perceived his uh, his jurisdiction as being further than that and the reason that he was brought in is again because he was seen as a uh for one thing a very respected figure and uh for another thing a, like a very an effective commander in his own right, but also quite a quite a good administrator, as I understand it. Just just to clarify, I know I know this is a very simple point, but for those of the who don't know, the the white forces are anti-Bolshevik, and they have certain support from you know Britain and so on, whereas the the Bolsheviks are this red patch here. So that's the conflict which is going on during this this civil war, um, yes. essentially during the revolution. And so Keller is on the white, white side, um, but he's going. He wants to go further than m most of the white forces, as I understand it, because yes. as you've said, he wants a restoration of full Tsardom, whereas many of them want a restoration of some kind of representative democracy. Um, yeah, in, in particular, the a lot of the uh, the original core of the uh, the white movement, especially in the volunteer army, comes from. Uh, Support essentially supporters of uh, Kornilov and Kerensky. Mm. Um, even though they had a bit of a falling out, essentially it's it's often uh, forces which are sympathetic to the idea of a uh, like a more dip uh, democratic, even so uh, social democratic Russia. Um, and what they're sort of rallying behind oftentimes is uh, yeah more more the provisional government, but that's only some of the commanders and some of the civil leaders it's really hard to tell oftentimes what the actual um sympathies were of uh of you know men on the ground yeah because it was a broad coalition it was i guess it's united a, a, against the negative uh, or with the negative of being against the bolsheviks yes so that's a yes. that's a huge group of people isn't it yeah um, everyone everyone from uh <laughs> from fervent czarists like uh like keller uh to um srs like socialist uh, revolutionaries who just happened to uh disagree with the bolsheviks on uh, on a handful of fairly small comparably small points so so keller gets um appointed as essentially governor of large parts of eastern europe uh during this conflict and um how does he go about doing that then so he uh, starts to uh, build his administration up in Kiev, um, and he does so with the help of 
his various uh, sort of like networks of uh, uh, you know pretty fervent czarists, uh, men who were involved in the Black Hundreds, former uh, czarist officials and administrators, you know people from the old government who were still uh, sympathetic, essentially just gathering up all of the uh, the elements of the Russian extreme right of the time that he, that, uh, he was in contact with, and uh, men who were sort of like much more uncompromising on uh, on what their vision of Russia was. Um, However, much to the dismay of a lot of uh, a lot of the, the uh, you know, would-be allies or you know actual allies in practice, he presented a very uncompromising view, not necessarily entirely from a position of military strength, and he, uh, you know arguably he estranged uh, potential allies by insisting on. Uh, you know, like on, on again, this full this full restoration from people who had a good amount of power and uh, you know didn't necessarily want to go back to the old times. So when you take it, it's it's not quite right because I believe Kornilov was already dead, dead by this time. But if you take someone like Kornilov, he was one of the main figures who actually initially founded the um, uh, the volunteer movement, but he was actually one of the most fervent supporters of Kerensky early on, or you know the um, the provisional government eventually run by Kerensky, but uh, but had a falling out. And so he's trying to to combine cause with, uh, you know, men who were basically celebrating, you know, especially certain officers who were celebrating the fact that the Tsar was gone. So that, that maybe shows, okay, he had absolute sincerity and conviction, which in the cases of Aurelian and of Henry II, or certainly men around Henry II, that was crucial to their success. But in this case, because he doesn't have the military strength to back it up, it, it maybe is politically a bit naive to, in, to insist upon that when it, it prevents him from building uh, alliances which would help his maybe a more moderate um, form of government being achieved. Yeah, so especially because... You know, probably partly caused by his, uh, you know, chauvinism and uh, and wartime experience and everything, he is not particularly keen on the idea of uh, forming extensive relationships with the the Germans. Mm. So this is at a time when the Germans are are just sort of like evacuating, uh, evacuating Ukraine after se after setting up a uh, a sympathetic government under uh, I believe it's Hetman Skoropadsky, and it's Skoropadsky that ultimately um, hands over power to Keller, but. Right. But Keller is, uh, is, is again, quite an un uncompromising figure. And so where Skoropadsky was willing to indulge, you know, it, uh, seemingly very cynically, by my reading, uh, indulge uh, things like Ukrainian nationalism for, uh, you know, for the sake of weaponizing it against Bolshevism, Keller was completely uncompromising. Um, I'm not sure what his specific um, views were on, uh, on Ukrainians, but uh, it, was, it was a common thread amongst the... Um, sort of like the Russian right of the time and people that he would have associated with that, uh, you know, Ukrainian wasn't really a, like a proper Russian identity. They, they were just, they were just Russians. Right. Mm -hmm. I see. So in his view, again, it's this Russian Tsardom, which the Tsar would have authority over these people. They'd be part of the empire. They don't have a separate nation that's going to form or anything like that. And so that alienates him from those who could have supported his rule in the region against the Bolsheviks. Um, and does this then play into his eventual demise? It does, because the uh, the force that is that is eventually um, sent against him is um, one under the uh, I can't remember what the exact government is called. It's the might be the Ukrainian National Republic or something, but um, they're they're colloquially called the Petliarists under Simon Petliara. Um, they uh, march on Kiev in significantly su uh, superior numbers than uh, than Keller is able to muster to uh, to sort of withstand their assaults, and eventually, despite sort of fighting valiantly, uh, he's he's essentially forced to accept the fact that the the Peleiris are going to storm the city. You know, basically, regardless of what he does about it, um, and it's at this point where the uh, the Peleirists are sort of. At f well, they're not necessarily quite willing to um, you know, let him go per se, but the 
Germans who were still around are sort of willing to get Keller out and uh, you know consider him to be potentially a, a useful figure. And there are even some other figures around, like uh, Vermont uh, Avalov, I believe he's around, and tries to convince um, Keller to you know basically side with side with the Germans, become an ally of the Germans, and through that continue to fight with the white forces, you know, potentially lead the white forces elsewhere under a, uh, you know, a, a, like a more um, friendly to Germany kind of um, policy, which is what Bermont Avalov uh, himself eventually does. So he leads, he leads a, a Northwestern Front army basically as an ally of, as an ally of the Germans. And I think at some points his army is actually consisting mostly of Germans. So yeah, I mean, ultimately, this is there's things like this additional manpower pool which uh, Keller is never never quite able to tap into in the same way. But yeah, ultimately, his uh, his obstinacy and his commitment to a full, complete restoration means that he uh, he loses out on these people and he loses out on allies like Germany, who would otherwise be willing to help because he's so you know committed to this particular vision. And he even um, the offer that's given to him to uh, to escape. And so, as, as I understand it, then he is actually captured by the Petlerists, um in due course. And uh, on his way to being arrested, he's shot, um, you know, unceremoniously, not at the proper execution point. No, uh, he, and... yeah, he, he was being uh, just moved from one place to another, essentially. And uh, and then someone shoots him, almost certainly the Petlerists who just don't want to, uh, you know, do things, do things officially, just sort of get it over and done with and basically try and hide him. Yeah, because then he becomes a rallying point, I guess, as well. Potentially. If it's, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, and to bring it yeah, back, to, to bring it bring it back to the sword. Actually, it's partly it's part of the reason why he um, he will not be um, he where he refuses to be uh, sort of spirited away because there's actually a, I think it was a secret passage that um, it, it's uh, is offered to be used mm. to him by uh, by the monks because he's taking refuge in a monastery and. Uh, he refuses to to take it to take this opportunity because it would require him to enter a disguise, which uh, he's not fond of in the first. He doesn't like the idea of that in the first place. Uh, rip off his epaulets, and uh, and discard the sword, the uh, sword that was gifted to him by uh, the Tsar personally. Ah, uh, so it's it's the loyalty it. to the Tsar again. Yeah, which um, means he can't do that. Even even if he could stomach the other stuff, it's that personal gift from his lord essentially. Uh, that uh, that will stop him from from leaving. So it is that it is that same spirit of um, that we've seen in somebody like William Marshall. But whereas with William Marshall, it leads to victory and reward. In this case, because he's his he's in a context where he, the alliances just don't match up with his vision of the world. It leads to his own defeat and 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 contributes eventually to the the success of the Bolsheviks. Yeah, you could you could say uh, in a more degenerate age, uh, he's not he's not rewarded for his mm. uh, for his virtues and his loyalty. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, so so, it, is there anything else that you would want to add to your how you've described Keller and his? His desire for restoration. I mean, yeah. The, the key thing that is is that uh, he 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 was exactly the right man for the job. Who was just sort of not given his opportunity. The key the key thing is that moment mm. just before the um, uh, the the proper outbreak of the uh, February Revolution when he was again, I contend, ordered to. Uh, ordered by the Tsar to go to Petrograd and quell the disturbances when they still, you know, when it, when it was still just a, uh, you know, a bunch of soldiers joyriding around the, around the city and uh, mm. lorries and things. Um, when it was still something that could be that could be put down so easily, uh, he was exactly the right man to do that. Even after other men who would have uh, been able to perform the same job and been able to avert this kind of crisis, they had already been lost by uh, various other providential providential means, uh, you know, leading up to this period. And Keller is the, the man left, and he is still enough. But again, due to uh, 
due to treachery, uh, treachery of, of men like uh, Ruski, he's not put in the right place at the right time. And so even though he can still be as, uh, as uncompromising, as dutiful, as virtuous as he was, and, uh, and true to his vision, and especially true to the vision of the empire that was uh, bequeathed to him by Nicholas, because it seems like Nicholas has more mm -hmm. or less the same, the same view that Keller inherits. Um, yeah, he's not, he's not given the, uh, the same opportunities as, as these other men who we talked about, who um, were bequeathed with a, a similarly righteous and lofty vision, but were given the opportunities and were rewarded for their commitment to them. But Keller isn't. I, w I wonder as well, well, there's, there's two things that I wonder here. One is that with Aurelian and Henry, we had two leaders in their own right. That and they they it works because they're on the one hand they have that heroic character, that force of will, which draws admiration from others who who want to obey and follow, especially virtuous individuals like William Marshall. Um and it's so it's the combination of their own character and their office and which allows them to shape the world in accordance with what with the vision that they have. Whereas with Keller, we're seeing somebody who who has the heroic character and to a limited degree has the office, but he's not the czar. And whether if the czar had the character of Keller, things could have played out differently. I, I raise that possibility. Uh, and then this, the second thing would be Keller himself, although he's been promoted quite high, he's never reached the rank of general. And I just wonder as well, you know, you've got this Rusky fellow who's um, there, but he's obviously not of the same character as Keller, whether Keller should have been promoted higher and whether that would have avoided some of the communication issues that we find later on. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, exactly that. Um, you could perhaps say, you know, at, at the time, perhaps there were there were concerns about um, how appropriate Keller was specifically mm. for his for, for a, like a higher position. So, you know, maybe maybe there was there were some things about his experience or about his commanding style that uh, made him appropriate. Maybe he didn't want to raise above the level where he would um, where we'd no longer be alongside his men more directly, because that can be a trouble of, uh, of rising too high in the hierarchy. Uh, in, the, in the military hierarchy, yeah. into, into staff ops, staff roles, and such, but um, yeah, ultimately, ultimately, it means that he never quite he never receives the message that uh, that he would need. No. But also, I, I, I wonder, likewise, if uh, if he'd simply been in a, in a place other than Kiev, um, under slightly different circumstances, then uh, you know perhaps things would have also been slightly different. Perhaps mm. he'd be, if he'd been given leadership of the um, you know true leadership of the a uh, southern volunteer army, which was uh, a bit more Russian in nature, then uh, perhaps that would have that would have contributed more to his success. Yeah, well, a lot of what is. Yeah, it, it, it's as you said, the opportunity just wasn't given at the in the right time or the right place. Um, but we could see that he had the potential to be that kind of figure, to have done, who have to uh, to have achieved much more if given that possibility. Um, well, um, I, I think uh, let's let's look at um, just we we ha we've had one question, and if there's any more questions, we can maybe bring them in. And this this goes back to um, Aurelian. Well, this before, was... before that, then can I can I just finish off the uh, the Keller bit with a, a poem that's written oh, about his death? Please do, please do. <clears throat> yeah, it's called Night of Glory. When the golden domed Kiev suddenly again rushed a violent wave. Count Keller, the hero of Russian glory, did not seek salvation in flight. He rejected all proposals, did not take, his, take off his hat or epaulets. Quote, I went to battle hundreds of times and saw death, he replied. Well, could he take off the cross of victory, which should always be on him? Part with this reserved sabre presented to him by the Tsar. The murderers, in a brutal black gang, broke into a peaceful monastery. He went out to meet them boldly, an epic Russian hero. The bastards quieted down. They were burning and tormented by a bright gaze. They are ashamed and are no longer happy to fulfill the sentence. Accompanied by villains, the Count left his last shelter. With him is the noble Pan 
Pantaleev, and the faithful Captain Ivanov. Silent night railed, reigned all around, covered in a white veil. Raising his horse over the abyss, Kelnitsi stood as if alive. Clearly to the beloved homeland, at the moment of rampant dark forces, he spoke about the one, indivisible in contrast to them. In front of this gang of prisoners, having created the Orthodox cross, Count Keller stead, stood up to his gigantic height, giving his life for the Tsar. So as to not meet his gaze, by chance, even in the night, cowardly finished off everyone from behind. The ex executioners fled from the bodies. Morning flickered, a trail of blood reddened on the snowy sl silver. So the, so the hero of Russian glory died with the last thought of the Tsar. That was beautiful, Rupert. It really encapsulates everything that you've been describing about Keller and uh, his magnificence of spirit and conviction and his loyalty to the Tsar. I th I th who, who wrote that poem? Uh, that was a gentleman named Piotr Shabelsky Bork in 1928. He did a wonderful job. He really did. Um, Translated oh. from Russian, of course. I, I don't really know how to follow that, to be honest. That was it's so powerful. But I, I shall do my best. And um we have one question from Shia Tori. Uh, hello to you, sir. Would you agree the crisis of the third century set the stage for the ascension of a Christian elite and give rise to the Constantinian dynasty? Uh gave rise to the Constantinian dynasty. Possibly, like I said, um, so I, I made direct allusions to him uh, and the way that uh, Aurelian and figures like him sort of um, chart out a, a uh, well, sort of like create an outline of what uh, Constantine will later fill, arguably, probably quite successfully, arguably much more, um, uh, much more completely and much more successfully given is uh, given Constantine's longevity and uh, and his more clear long-lasting impact on the on the future trajectory of rome but the christians um the uh the excellent talk that was given by um uh Rad, yeah, Radlib, radical liberation at the uh the witan which is uh, on youtube i think ske sketches out and makes a pretty compelling case as to uh how the successful rise of the christians did sort of coincide with this period but is not necessarily um is not necessarily due to uh, or due to Aurelian in any, in any particular way, although you could perhaps say that he um, made Rome sort of more ready for the uh, the kind of mono monotheistic religion that they would uh, that they would eventually adopt. I, I definitely think that last point is really important because the the identification of one god across the empire, the uh, identification of certain dates for the festivals. All of these things get re drawn into the Christian religion. And certainly, you know, the sun in, in Plato, the sun is the child of the good, the symbol of the good within the physical world. It's a very easy jump to an omnipotent creator of all reality uh, that we find in Christianity. So certainly in terms of the religious landscape and the metaphysics that are involved, it, there's a there's an easy transition. It's not it's not like the um a transition from jupiter perhaps uh or, or the or the, jupiter and the rest of the gods uh to christianity um that that's all i'd add shia Shai comes back in here just saying quickly i would say their success was down to the crisis and decentralization of the empire during its time of strife well like uh, i said the, the counterintuitive thing there is that the uh well not counterintuitive perhaps but um, the crisis of the third, third century and the, uh, the trajectory during the dominate in general is one towards greater centralization. Mm -hmm. So the period perhaps immediately prior to the eventual fall of Western Rome is probably when it's at its most powerful in some ways from the perspective of the central government. There, there is an interesting point that Radlib does raise and maybe it ties in with the crisis before Aurelian which is that when um, people were dying of plague, most most Romans would just 
kind of abandon them, uh, desert them because, you know, they didn't want to catch the plague. But the Christian communities, you know, essentially had hospitals or people who would care for other sick Christians. So if you were dying of plague, that's the place that you would want to, you would want to be a Christian because they're the people that are going to care for you um, if you're in that situation. And that's one of the ways in which they're able to, to gain more and more followers, particularly amongst the elites, because they, you know, they want this security. Um, the the talk, I'll, I'll see if I can find a link for it and put it in the chat because it really is fantastic. Um, but yes, uh, Rupert, is there anything that you would like to add by way of final statement on this topic for the time being? Um, I think um, regardless of the extent to which they uh, they were successful, I think a lot of these figures all uh, fit into a, a similar kind of mold. So especially the thing that sort of binds a lot of them together is the, a, a lot of these sort of periods together is almost regardless of what the the higher born aristocrat or you know royal is is doing um there is a very prominent almost like ultra loyalist underneath this obviously comes comes through most prominently in uh, in keller um but i would argue it also applies to um aurelian himself being that he is of uh, you know non noble birth initially and, and sort of has to rise out of out of his uh, humble more humble origins this uh, this phenomenon of like the ultra loyalist loyal servant um, is something that shines through in all of these cases. And uh, as you know, if we ever do come back to this topic, then we'll, we'll see that it's uh, it repeats in other places as well. And I, I think it's quite a powerful archetype, if one that uh, that is seemingly quite rare, um, albeit in modern time, in more modern times, we, uh, well, as you get closer to the present, it, it becomes less and less um, rewarded. Yes, I, th I think that's a really great way to put it. And I would just add to that, that these examples, although they may, you know, they're, they're not in modern times, they do show us in quite a vivid and striking way that there can be periods of anarchy, of societal disintegration, of real crisis, which at the moment we are not quite in yet, but we're you know, we're, we're not in the severity of the, the Roman crisis. We're not in the severity of English anarchy. But it was possible to bring restoration. It was possible for a figure with a with group with a group around him to re-establish the empire, to re-revive the culture and the moral order. And that, to me, is very inspiring because then it's no longer just a, a flight of fancy we read in fiction but it actually happened in history. And that gets you to think about, okay, maybe maybe there is a possibility of that in the future for us. Maybe, or maybe not even for us, but we can lay the seeds for that sort of figure to arise in the future. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope this stream is not just informative for those of you watching, but also inspiring and moves you to, to really think about how that could how you could contribute to that sort of thing happening in the future. Um, yes, so I want to thank you again, Rupert. You, you've put in a lot of work and I've learned a lot. I've, I think the audience will be very appreciative too of the, just the level of detail that, and, but, but at the same time, the way you're able to go through the, the key ideas or core narratives which take place in each of these three individuals. So thank you so much, Rupert, for making the time to do this. Oh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, sort of talk, talk about some of my favorite figures in this kind of uh, restorationist tradition that we're uh, sketching out. And, you know, Lord willing, we will, we will have a second stream uh, because I think that, you know, you, you gave me a list with so many names. There's so many other people we can look at with maybe some slightly different emphases as well. So that, that could be quite interesting. Um, next stream on this channel. Uh, well, um, our major next stream is going to be English Restoration, quite aptly. And on the 23rd of April, St. George's Day, at 9 p.m. BST, we're going to be discussing St. George particularly St. George and the Dragon. And it'll be myself, Rupert, and 
uh, Scott Mannion, who's been a guest on before, and a debutante, Nord Hugo, who loves talking about mythology and legends and so on. So it should be a really great conversation looking at the history and mythology of St. George. And uh, yeah, so I hope to see you all there. And beyond that, there may be some time later this week, I'm somebody asked me to do this and I'm quite, I, I, I think I'll go ahead. I'm going to read a, a couple of HP Lovecraft stories, do some, go back to story hour. So they're not too long, but they should be um, quite interesting and entertaining. So in the meantime, thank you all for watching. I, I'm very appreciative of it. It's a real privilege and very humbling that you would spend your hours watching this show. Till next time, God bless you, whoever you are, wherever you are. Bye for now, everybody.